closest thing to crazy I have ever been been 22 acting 17 Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Revelation Gospel Choir.
morning. Hello, are you well? Yes, good. Mm. We're gonna sing a song about being together, staying together, and staying true to who you are. I'm not a stranger to the dark. Hide away, they say, because we don't want your broken parts. I learned to be ashamed of all my scars. Run away, they say, no one will love you as you are. But I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us, for we are glorious. When the sharpest words wanna cut me down Come on! I'm gonna send a flood, gonna drown them out I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be This is me, look out, cause here I come Come on, say And I'm marching on to the beat I drum I'm not scared to be seen Join in singing. Is that all right? Three people says it's all right. Some more over here. Is that all right? Yes, yes, yes. Good, good, good, good. The song is called We Shall Overcome. We shall overcome every obstacle. Just if when we're together, we can achieve anything. All right? So singing is involved with the moving. So you can, you're allowed to sit still. But uh, we need a little movement. Okay. All right. We shall
right? So everybody here, try to sit up straight and try to sing along with us, okay? Sit. We shall overcome. What about you guys over here? We shall overcome. Yeah, that's great. Ah. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart. Oh, deep in my heart.
wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you. Dear fellow trade unionists, my warmest greetings to all of you attending the Fourth World Congress. The International Trade Union Confederation is crucial to building the power of workers, fighting for rights, decent work, equality and social justice. Together you improve the daily lives of millions of people around the world. And what you do is part of a larger cause. Because we, the global labor movement, aim to create a global economy that oppresses no one and benefits everyone. And the key to this kind of economy is the social dialogue that trade unions make possible. Social dialogue is an ethical question because workers who create wealth should have the right to benefit from it. But social dialogue is also a question of good government because the societies where trade unions, employers, and governments work together are also more sustainable, wealthy, and flexible in the face of technological change. So social dialogue is not just ethically right, it's also economically smart. And that's why I launched the Global Deal, to promote social dialogue globally. And I'm deeply grateful for the ITUC's support every step of the way. I'm also inspired to know that 207 million members stand shoulder to shoulder ready to continue your work with social dialogue as a tool and a fairer global economy as a goal, ready to create a brighter future for us all. I wish you the best of luck with your Congress and with all the work that lies ahead. Vamos dar início então à plenária. Todos com fone de ouvido. Atenção, é... ontem nós tivemos uma votação sobre a proposta da FLCU de ampliação de dois para cinco vice-presidentes. E nós informamos ontem que a, a Comissão de Credenciais e a Comissão de Regulamento deveria se posicionar sobre o assunto. Só que ainda não tem uma posição final, nem da Comissão de Credenciamento e nem da Comissão de Regulamento. Portanto, nós, vamos, nós não vamos chamar para dar o um informe, porque ainda não tem posicionamento sobre a votação de ontem. Então, nós vamos deixar para quando a Comissão de Credenciamento e a Comissão de Regulamento tiveram uma posição, nós vamos informar o plenário sobre o posicionamento e aí a gente vê o que é que nós vamos fazer de acordo com o posicionamento da Comissão de Credenciamento. Portanto, permanece válida a votação que teve ontem e vamos ver se até amanhã a gente consiga concluir este processo e possamos sair daqui todos unidos em torno de uma CSI cada vez mais forte. Ok? Então está suspensa ainda os informes da Comissão de Credenciamento sobre a votação de ontem. Eu chamaria agora, o... nós vamos fazer nesse momento da plenária uma homenagem ao companheiro Lula, ex-presidente do Brasil, e pelas perseguições que ele tem sofrido em nosso país, pela prisão, é, pelo impedimento dele ser candidato, eu chamaria o companheiro Lisboa para que ele viesse aqui para fazer a leitura da carta do ex-presidente Lula a, aos delegados deste Congresso. O Lula mandou uma carta dirigida a vocês. Então, o companheiro Lisboa, que é 
secretário internacional da CUT Brasil, vai ler a carta. Hã? Você tem inglês aqui? Não, ele tem português. Português. Eu leio em português? Português. Ok. Bom dia. Uh, me escutam? Me escutam? Bom dia. Com... Companheiros e companheiras, bom dia. O companheiro presidente Lula está, é, para quem não sabe, muitos, muitos é, já sabem, é, a companheira Sharon já fez uma visita ao presidente Lula no Cáceres. É, o companheiro Han, da Coreia do Sul, também já esteve em Curitiba. A companheira Suzana esteve em Curitiba. É, não, não sei se mais um outro, um outro companheiro ou companheira estiveram lá. O companheiro Lula está é, preso na cidade de Curitiba, que é uma cidade do sul do Brasil, e onde foi encarcerado pelo juiz, que hoje é, como disse ontem, o ministro da Justiça do Brasil. Ou seja, o presidente Lula é, ele gosta muito de usar é, é, imagens do futebol, né? E a gente costuma dizer que o, o, o Moro ter prendido, o juiz Moro ter prendido o Lula para depois ser ministro da Justiça do adversário do Lula é como se no jogo Real Madrid e Barcelona ou Barcelona e um time pequeno se expulsasse o Messi, o Soares, enfim, toda a equipe do Barcelona e depois o juiz fosse receber o prêmio do time vencedor, do time pequeno vencedor. É isso que acontece no Brasil. Então, o presidente Lula mandou uma carta, eu vou ler aqui, é escrito lá do seu, da, da, de Curitiba. Diz, queridos companheiras e companheiros, é com grande alegria que me dirijo aos participantes do 4 Congresso da Confederação Sindical Internacional. Os temas que serão debatidos por vocês em Copenhague são fundamentais e estão no centro da batalha que temos que travar no mundo e também aqui no Brasil. Hoje, mais do que nunca, precisamos de um movimento sindical forte e unido para, juntos, lutar pela democracia, resgatar e fortalecer os direitos trabalhistas e alcançar uma sociedade mais justa e igualitária. No Brasil, nossa jovem democracia vem sendo duramente atacada. Dois anos atrás, um golpe de Estado destituiu a presidenta eleita Dilma Rousseff, jogando o país no caos. Direitos sociais foram retirados em benefício do mercado especulativo e de interesses corporativos nacionais e estrangeiros. Este ano, apesar de liberar, liderar as pesquisas eleitorais, fui impedido de concorrer à presidência da República. O povo brasileiro não pôde, assim, exercer o direito de eleger livremente seus representantes. Foi para alcançar este objetivo que fui condenado sem nenhuma prova. Mesmo assim, venho enfrentando todas as acusações infundadas contra mim com base na lei. Recentemente, o Comitê de Direitos Humanos da ONU acatou minhas alegações e reconheceu meus direitos políticos. Poucos dias atrás, como prova clara dessa perseguição política, o juiz que me condenou de forma ilegal abandonou a magistratura e aceitou tornar-se ministro do governo de extrema-direita que assumirá o Brasil. A verdade é que os nossos adversários nunca aceitaram o legado que deixamos ao país. 
mas eles estão muito enganados se pensam que irão nos render assim tão fácil. O Partido dos Trabalhadores nasceu da resistência à ditadura e, mesmo nos momentos mais difíceis, nunca desistimos. Pelo contrário, lutamos e alcançamos a redemocratização do país e, anos depois, chegamos ao governo, retiramos 36 milhões de pessoas da miséria e geramos 20 milhões de empregos formais. É por isso que seguiremos de cabeça erguida para defender a democracia e os direitos conquistados por nosso povo. Queremos finalizar agradecendo de coração a todas as mensagens de solidariedade que tenham recebido e pelos diversos atos de, do movimento sindical internacional que o movimento sindical internacional realizou ao redor do mundo, exigindo o fim das inúmeras arbitrariedades cometidas contra mim e a democracia brasileira. Temos uma grande batalha pela frente, mas saber que podemos contar com a solidariedade incondicional de milhões de trabalhadores e trabalhadoras nos dá ainda mais convicção de que vamos vencer mais uma batalha. Um abraço fraterno, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Lula livre! Vamos levantar agora para bater uma fotografia. We're going to take a photo of the whole conference as a gift for Lula, but I'm just wondering, Horst, could you direct us about whether the people on the stage could be down, should be down or up here? Where is our photographer? Behind you. I think it's better. You want us down here or up here? Everyone, let me know. We want the whole hall. If you, if you uh, as post in this, in this position and you take a shot of us. Which one? Okay, down. You get down. You get all your down. You put it here. Is it? Yeah, into the down. Okay. Let's go back side. Let's go back side. And hold your red scarves up if you've got them. Okay? Agora eu vou passar a palavra ao companheiro Peter, que é quem vai coordenar esta mesa que vai debater regulamentação do poder econômico. Então, o companheiro Peter, da LO da Suécia e vice-presidente da CSI, que vai é, coordenar essa segunda mesa desse congresso. Peter. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm uh, proud to be. Uh conductor today, and I uh, hope we can have good cooperation. I can uh, warn, red, warn you already now, I'm not as liberal as uh, Joao. If it's four minutes, it's four minutes, then I will uh, take you down, promise. Four minutes is four minutes. The signal is to stop talking, not to continue talking. Um, secondly, uh, You know the, uh, the, the situation uh, that uh, Joao was informing you about? That was about the vote we did yesterday, and, and um, 
uh, that the credential is not ready with a question yet, but Eva Nordmark, the president of Credential Committee, has other statements too for Congress. So first we give the floor to Eva Nordmark. She can have an applause. Well, uh, thank you, Cher. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to give you uh, the second report from the Credentials Committee. Uh, first of all, we had a lot of questions yesterday, uh, two meetings, and um, we examined the eligibility of the two candidates for the post of General Secretary, and we found that both were eligible. It's a very difficult uh, word eligible. Uh, the nominations received uh, for the position of General Secretary are as follows. Sharon Burrow, nominated by 91 organizations from 59 countries. And, uh, yeah, and uh, Susanna Camuso, uh, Susanna Camuso, nominated by 36 organizations from 25 countries. And there is a, a long list, yeah. It, I have a long list, uh, and you can read in the written uh, report. Uh, you can go to the website and around 11 our written report will be there. So if you want to see all the organizations from which countries uh, the nominations, you can find it in our report. Um, then when it comes to uh, the election tomorrow, I will come back to you tomorrow to inform on the exact procedure. But uh, I want to inform Congress that the procedure adopted for the elections of the General Secretary allows delegation leaders to vote by proxy to a duly nominated and credentialized uh, delegate of the same organization. The uh, committee, we discussed this and we strongly urge delegation leaders to avoid voting by proxy as it increases risk, the risk of irregularities. In case a delegation leader cannot cast the vote of his delegation in person, she or he can ask the ITUC secretariat. You can come to the credentials committee room. It's room uh, 66. There you can uh, find this form. Uh, it will be available uh, there, uh, a form for a valid proxy. Then I also want to report on uh, the representation at Congress. Uh, we have now the provisional figures uh, of participation, and we have 247 organizations of 131 countries and territories. They are represented by 766 delegates who are accompanied, accompanied uh, by 181 advisors, secretariats, and in interpreters. 79 observers from affiliated organizations are also present. And this brings the total attendance from affiliated organizations to 1,026 at total. At the Fourth World Congress, 441 women participants from affiliated organizations are attending. 353 are delegates. 61 advisors, secretaries or interpreters, and 27 observers. And that brings the provisional percentage of women delegates to 46.1%. Um, and when it comes to the young uh, participation, uh, participants, uh, we have 74 delegates out of a total of 766. Uh, who are younger than 35. 
and that is 9.7%. Uh, N19 advisors, and so on, 11 observers. Um, yes, the gender balance question is very important, and we have find, found out, uh, found 19 violations, um, and all those delegations will be contacted by I2C staff and requested to nominate a number of delegates to be registered as observers to, to restore the balance in their delegation. And finally, when it comes to the vote on the amendment of the AFL-CIO, we have discussed this question within the Credentials Committee. Uh, we considered the vote on the amendment to the Constitution put forward by the AFL-CIO concerning the number of ITUC deputy presidents. Of the delegates present in the room yesterday, 282 voted in favor, 135 voted against, and 21 abstentions. Um, against the provisional numbers on participation that we have today, this res result represents a majority of 64.5%. It does, however, not represent two-thirds of the total number of registered delegates at Congress. And um, the, next, uh, the next meeting within the credentials is today at 3 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. Um, so we will come back uh, about the vote. It was uh, legitimate uh, yesterday. Uh, so we... No, other day. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah. On behalf of the AFL-CIO, we would like to demand that there be a roll call vote. Um, since this question was unclear yesterday about the votes being either delegates present or registered delegates, we would like to ask uh, that there be a roll call vote, which requires, I think, a threshold of 25 million uh, per capita votes to request, which we believe we have the support for a roll call vote. And in asking for this roll call vote, our intent is actually to delay the actual roll call vote until after the election of General Secretary tomorrow. Uh, we believe that this vote on the amendment is actually being caught up or, or mired into the politics of the vote for General Secretary tomorrow. We are not allowed uh, then to debate the substance of the event, of the amendment, which I know there are still questions and, and we would love to have that debate uh, perhaps on Thursday after the election takes place tomorrow. Uh, that way we are allowed to have peace in, uh, in the Congress for the next uh, you know, 24 to 48 hours. We allow democracy uh, to take place and, and allow for free debate and inclusiveness um, on the substance of this constitutional amendment and not get mired down in procedural uh, distractions today. So if we can ask the chairs permission to um, demand the roll call vote, but that the roll call vote actually take place on Thursday. Does that make sense? Am I clear? Yes, it's uh, fully understandable, but uh, to have a roll call uh, vote, you need uh, to have uh, 25 million. Uh, yep. How many votes? Well, that's what I'm trying to yeah. um, Because Eva, I don't know, you mentioned the number of organizations, you mentioned the number of delegates, um, but 
you did not mention how many votes those organizations do represent, or maybe I missed that. Eva, is Eva here? Yeah, João. Eu, como eu estava dirigindo a plenária que discutiu o assunto, eu gostaria de dar a minha opinião. Que bom que fique claro que eu votei favorável à proposta da FLCU. No entanto, eu não conheço nenhum artigo no Estatuto da CSI que diz que quando uma votação feita através dos delegados credenciados possa ser substituída por um outro tipo de votação. Portanto, eu concordo com o encaminhamento que a companheira da FLCU fez de que a votação ocorra na quinta-feira, mas que nós não decidamos, nesta, neste momento aqui, como é que vai ser a votação na quinta-feira. Porque eu não conheço artigo do Estatuto que diz que pode fazer isso. Portanto, nós vamos estudar o Estatuto, a Comissão de Regulamento vai tomar posicionamento também. Vamos ver se até quinta-feira nós encont possamos encontrar uma proposta negociada, aí na quinta-feira a gente decide, tanto como vai ser a votação, se é que vai ter alguma votação. Esse é o encaminhamento que eu faço. Ok? Ok. Thank you. Thank you, João. Uh, Plamen, and then uh, side, on this side here, Plamen. Uh, thank you, Carpeta. I, I just wanted to support on behalf of the Bulgarian delegation uh, the proposal just made by Alice Schuller and uh, support it as, uh, as understood uh, by our president, uh, uh, João Felicio. So to call for a, a roll vote, uh, uh, not today, but uh, uh, after the election of General Secretary in Thursday. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. We continue with four speakers here. Yeah, on behalf of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, we also support the roll call vote on Thursday. Yeah, next one, yeah. Yes. Cristina Faciaben, de Comisiones Obreras de España. Eh, creemos que no hay, no hay espacio para la discusión. Eh, está claro que, que el Comité de Credenciales ha resuelto que la enmienda no ha, no ha podido prosperar porque no se ha cumplido con el requisito de los dos tercios de los delegados eh, y delegadas eh, acreditados. Por tanto, mmm, no se cumplen los requisitos que establece la propia Constitución de la CSI. Y aquí no, no, no podemos estar hablando de una repetición, de, unas, de, de una votación que ya se ha producido, que se ha producido, no se ha cuestionado eh, si con algún tipo de defecto formal o de ningún, de ningún tipo. Por tanto, El resultado de la votación es el que es, es un resultado válido que no cumple con ese requisito. Queremos hablar de democracia, no podemos hacerlo si lo que pretendemos hacer es modificar el propio orden del día del programa, el propio reglamento de, del, perdón, del Congreso y, asimismo, la propia Constitución de la que todos nos hemos dotado. Gracias. Thank you very much. Next one. Please make it quick if you can. Bonjour, President. Um, Rafael Lamas de la FGTB Belgique. Je voudrais effectivement poser la question de problème de la démocratie. Nous avons eu hier un vote. Nous avions, le président a dit qu'il allait poser une question effectivement à la commission de vérification des mandats. Nous avons eu le résultat par la présidente de cette commission qui est clair. En respectant la constitution et l'article 18, paragraphe B, nous n'avons pas atteint les deux tiers des délégués inscrits au Congrès. Donc, l'amendement est simplement rejeté. C'est ça la démocratie. Et donc, Nous pensons qu'il est nécessaire, effectivement, de continuer ce congrès. Nous savons, nous, nous savons, nous savons qu'il y a 30 inscrits qui, hier, n'ont pas pu prendre la parole. Nous pensons qu'il faudrait pouvoir continuer ce congrès et pouvoir continuer le débat entre nous, sur, notamment en écoutant ces 30 intervenants qui n'ont pas encore eu l'occasion de s'exprimer. Merci. Thank you very much. We're, first, we take uh, Jap, Jap Inan first. Chair, I think that Raphael, of course, is correct to mention uh, Article 18. Um, we have a practical issue here. That is that he is quoting um, the Part B, but the Part C says that voting shall um, take place by the total membership credentials. Now, 
the problem is, of course, that yesterday, when this discussion took place and the voting took place, then we did not know yet the number of credential membership, because that was only reported 10 minutes ago. That was only reported 10 minutes ago. I'm just mentioning facts, eh? I'm just mentioning facts. It was mentioned 10 minutes ago, and that means that how can we and how could we now say that this number was representing something mentioned in the statutes or not. That was not known yesterday. So that's why, of course, we cannot refer to a number that was not known yet yesterday. That seems very simple. Yep, first there and then we go back there. Спасибо, председатель. Михаил Шмаков, ФНПР Россия. Я считаю, что я считаю, что вчера мы голосованием определили от количества присутствующих делегатов голосование набрало две трети присутствующих. Поэтому э, можно признать э, состоявшимся голосование, которое было вчера. Но если есть делегаты, которые настаивают на том, что надо переголосовать, то тогда действительно я поддерживаю, что переголосовывать надо в четверг, и если необходимо, то поименно ФНПР к этому присоединяется. Окей, тогда мы имеем длинный лист здесь. Так что, пожалуйста, будьте быстрее. Euh, bonjour, merci de Monsieur le Président de me donner la parole. Je voudrais répéter ce qu'ont dit certains de mes prédécesseurs pour confirmer que le vote tel qu'il a été réalisé hier euh, s'est déroulé dans de bonnes conditions. Euh, la commission des mandats n'a d'ailleurs pas mis euh, en cause les conditions euh, du vote euh, d'hier. La présidente de la commission nous a confirmé ce matin, tout à l'heure, que le vote n'avait pas recueilli conformément au statut euh, les deux tiers nécessaires pour que l'amendement soit adopté. Euh, donc euh, il nous semble, en tout cas pour euh, la CFDT de France que je représente, euh, qu'il n'est pas question euh, de réorganiser euh, un vote demain euh, euh, ou euh, jeudi. Un vote a eu lieu. On ne peut pas euh, répéter euh, chaque jour euh, des votes sur euh, des amendements qui n'ont pas recueilli euh, le nombre de voix nécessaires pour être adoptés. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, we go further on. Yes, thank you. On behalf of FFV the Netherlands, I want to support the proposal of AFL-CIO, and I hope that we can stop this discussion and go on with Congress, because we have a lot of big issues to discuss. So let's stop and do it on Thursday. Thank you. And then... Good morning. On behalf of the Iceland, the Confederation of Labour, we support the roll vote on Thursday. Good morning. On behalf of BSRP Iceland, we support the roll call on Thursday. Chair. Good morning, Chair. On behalf of ELO Norway, we support the proposal from AFL to call for a roll call on Thursday. Thank you. Chair. Chair. Chair. 採決の時にシャラン書記長はこれを挙げてましたよね。大議員の資格はないでしょう。これは全くおかしいと思いますよ。もう結論は出ている話です。再び投票する必要はありません。以上。チェア、Excuse me。チェア、Hello。Buenos días desde la CUT Chile。Saludar a la mesa、saludar a todos los congresistas。Señalar que respecto de esta votación, si bien es compartido el sentido que tiene respecto a la importancia de generar más espacios de democracia y participación, es evidente que en el marco de este Congreso forzar nuevamente una votación lo único que puede generar es más tensión. 
estas propuestas, si bien son necesarias de analizar, y nosotros desde las Américas hemos hecho el debate con los compañeros de la FLCIO, nos parece que es importante tener mucho más tiempo y más calma para que este tipo de instancias de mayor democracia y más participación se puedan instalar y se puedan asumir como parte de un desafío estratégico de la organización y no como parte de un debate que en estos minutos tiene más carácter electoral que otra cosa. Por lo tanto, nos parece que no es necesario repetir y que más bien debemos seguir profundizando el trabajo para que los objetivos de este Congreso se cumplen que es reforzar el poder de los trabajadores y eso no es a costa de votaciones forzadas. Yes, Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU. The reason why it's important that we support the AFL-CIO proposal about this vote being dealt with again on Thursday is we want to get on with the business of this Congress. The topic this morning is regulating economic power. This is so fundamental to what we're trying to do in terms of organising workers around the world. We all know that this is a distraction and it is a very sensible, practical proposal to have the matter dealt with again on Thursday. Thursday, where we have the opportunity to use the new proposal in terms of how the voting will be done. It is clear that there was a two-thirds support on the floor yesterday. For those that are calling to use the formality of checking that we reach the threshold of the, uh, the other requirement to do the vote, then that is fine. But let's not distract ourselves from the business of trying to organise workers, win economic power, do talk about the issues that all of our members from around the globe have paid for us to be here to discuss. So we support uh, that the deferral of the discussion to this till Thursday. Thank you. Now we continue here. Gracias, Presidente. José Antonio Cepé de Nicaragua. ¿Se dan cuenta por qué cuando dije ayer que esta cosa estaba confundida y enredada? Aquí están las consecuencias. Cuando queremos hacer las cosas, somos capaces hasta de negar a la comisión que está facultada para decidir si es válido o no una votación y ha dicho que no es válida porque no cumplió los estatutos. Entonces, ¿por qué queremos forzar a una votación? ¿Por qué queremos forzar a algo por un mero capricho de alguien? Yo creo que estamos... Ahí dice, cambiemos las reglas. ¿Para qué? Para retroceder. Queremos cambiar las reglas para acomodar. Queremos cambiar las reglas para ser satisfactorio de algunos. Cambiemos las reglas para mejorar para cambiar y para ser mejores. Seamos transparentes, decimos, comencemos por nosotros mismos, respetándonos. Y aquí se debe respetar una votación que se dio ayer, que los que tuvimos una posición respetamos y que ahora nos quieren imponer otra decisión porque es capricho de algunos. Así que, Presidente, no hay más votación. Thank you very much. We'll go there. Thank you, thank you Comrade Chair. My name is Peggy from COSATU. Yesterday, debate we have a number of constitutional amendments that we adopted. If we start now to doubt whether we're meeting the quorum only on one, it may mean we have to revisit all the others that we have taken based on the, on the two-third majority. We can't select one out of all the amendment. If the report that is presented by the Credential Committee that we did not meet the two-thirds on this one, then we must accept that one. Otherwise, we must go to each of them and check whether we meet the two-thirds. And if we're allowed to do that, comrade, this Congress will be a mess because we have to go to each and every constitutional amendment that we adopted to check whether we get the two-thirds majority. Let's not go there because if we do that, we'll be in a mess in my view. Thank you very much. So we go back there. Thank you, Cher, and their colleagues. My name is Sinova Ribeiro, and in the behalf of TCO Sweden, we support our American colleague and her support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Joran Arius, representing SACO Sweden, and we support the, the proposition from AFL-CIO. Thank you. Now we go over there. Merci, Président. Marjorie Alexandre, Force Ouvrière France. Nous soutenons la proposition faite par nos camarades de la FLCIO, euh, suite également aux précisions apportées par, par IAP. C'est un amendement qui, visiblement, fait débat, mais qui fait débat au-delà euh, de, de ce qu'il est. Je pense qu'il faut veiller à ne pas prendre en otage un, un débat pour une question 
euh, de euh, candidature et ne pas, mélanger, euh, ne pas mélanger les choses. Moi, je me souviens qu'au Conseil général euh, de la CSI en décembre 2017, euh, un certain nombre d'organisations euh, avaient fait appel à la démocratie, à une meilleure représentation euh, des régions euh, au sein euh, de, euh, de la CSI. Il me semble que cet amendement va en ce sens. Donc, euh, en appeler à la démocratie, justement, c'est ce que fait euh, cette, euh, cet amendement proposé par la FLCIO. Euh, donc, Puisqu'on en appelle à la démocratie, pourquoi en, a, en, a, en avoir peur Donc, euh, Je ne vois pas ce qui, ce qui se passe ici. Donc, On soutient euh, la proposition faite par euh, les camarades de la FLCIO. Thank you very much. We go back there. Good morning. On the behalf of SAK Finland, we would like to support the proposal of AFL-CIO on World Call Vote on, on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go over there. Colleague to the right. Good morning. My name is Inkore Chimba from the Zambia Congress of Trade Unions. We support that the roll call proceeds on Thursday so that we are seen to respect our rules. Thank you. Antip. Good morning. My name is Antti Palola, representing STTK Finland, and we support the AFL-CIO's proposal on voting on, on Thursday. Thank you. Over there. Bonjour, je suis Amal El Amri du Maroc, UMT Maroc. Je crois qu'il ne faut pas que ce congrès sombre dans les mélandres pour des considérations électorales. Nous avons voté un, un amendement je, avec d'autres amendements et Becky a raison de dire que si on remet en cause un amendement, il va falloir tout remettre en cause et revoir tous les votes. À mon avis, on a voté, on a voté, c'est un amendement comme tous les autres qui sont passés et il faut continuer le débat. Voilà. Merci. Thank you. Ragnar Lied, président de l'Union Norway, nous soutenons un rôle vote sur Thursday. Thank you. Yep. On est sommes tout à fait d'accord, l'UGTM Maroc, de recommencer le vote le jeudi. Et je ne sais pas pourquoi nous voulons ne pas recommencer ce vote, parce qu'il n'y avait pas tout à fait la totalité pour qu'on puisse voter. Donc c'est pour cela que nous n'étions pas avertis pour venir voter. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we continue there. Good morning. On behalf of Hello Sweden, we support the proposal from AFL-CIO. Thank you. Go over there again. On behalf of Indonesian delegate, we support roll call yesterday. Thank you. Uh, we want to be a... AFL-CIO. Thank you. Thank you. Muy buenos días, autoridades. Muy buenos días, colegas. El día de ayer, cuando don Joao indicó que quien se oponía a la propuesta de la ampliación de las eh, vicepresidencias, fui el primero en oponerme. Y ayer lo indiqué y lo vuelvo a reiterar. Un cambio de tal magnitud necesita un análisis exhaustivo que carezca o contenga la argumentación y la motiva, motivación y motivación necesarias porque estamos hablando de la buena marcha de la CSI. El día de ayer se dio una votación y la votación fue suficientemente clara. La democracia no solamente es el derecho de sufragio, sino también el respeto y la tolerancia al resultado. El día de ayer quedó totalmente demostrado que no se cumplió la totalidad necesaria para la admitibilidad de ese cambio estatutario. Por tanto, consideramos que no es necesario volver a repetir la votación. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We go to the right. Thank you very much. My name is Kasa Umfolo. Um, on behalf of the Confederation of Ethiopian Trade Unions, we fully support the proposal submitted by the American colleagues. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. There. Muy buenos días, Miguel Edward de Panamá. La verdad, compañeros delegados, mesa principal, no se trata de aplicar la democracia cuando me conviene o no me conviene. Se trata inclusive de respetar nuestros estatutos y respetar el trabajo de la comisión. La comisión rindió un informe y dijo no se, tu, no se tienen las dos terceras partes, los votos necesarios para que la propuesta pase. Entonces, ¿por qué enfrascarnos en una discusión innecesaria 
y respetando lo establecido en, nuestra, en nuestros estatutos. La propuesta ya fue votada, no tuvo los votos y esa es la posición nuestra. Thank you very much. Uh, we go over there. Now we must uh, soon uh, take a decision. Agil Dadashev, Confederacy of the of Azerbaijan. We also think that if such a question was raised, we should vote on Tuesday. There will be no issues. It will take some time, but we will have a consensus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Francis. Francis O'Grady from the TUC in London. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, and my first opportunity to speak during what is our 150th birthday of the TUC. Uh, whatever side of the debate that people are on, I would like to remind people that our whole history uh, of the trade union movement uh, and in the constitution of the ITUC is that we believe what is most important to us as trade unionists around the world is building unity and consensus. That comes first. And therefore, rather than um, end up in a conflict on this issue, I would like the opportunity for AFL-CIO to talk with other trade unionists and to bring this back on Thursday and see if we can find unity and consensus because that is what workers of the world need from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm from IS Norway and uh, we support the proposal from A AFL CAO. Thank you very much. Buenos días, señor presidente, Roberto Gradel de la CTA de los Trabajadores. Nosotros ayer aproba, eh, aprobamos, votamos a favor de la propuesta de la FLCIO porque nos parece una propuesta a considerar interesante y que se tiene que debatir. Ahora hubo una votación. La votación determinó si la votación hubiera determinado que se aprobara la propuesta, no se pasaba una nueva votación. De la misma manera tenemos que respetar la regla de juego porque tenemos que estar todos unidos y no nos podemos dividir por una votación de estas características. Sigámoslos debatiendo, pero la votación que se hizo ayer se tiene que considerar válida. Gracias, Presidente. Buenos días. Buenos días a todos y a todas. Yo también vengo de una organización centenaria, de la Unión General de Trabajadores, que cumple este año 130 años. En 130 años, mi organización ha construido... Estructuras internacionales siempre basándose en la democracia y en el respeto. No voy a expresar mi opinión sobre el contenido de la propuesta de los compañeros de la FCLI, AFL-CIO. Pero sí que quiero leer un párrafo de la Constitución. En el artículo 18, procedimiento de voto, el artículo C, el voto por delegación, lo voy a, lo voy a leer en, en, en inglés, dice... Voting shall, as a rule, be by shown of hands, but at the request of the delegation representing at least 25% of the total membership credentials to the Congress, a roll call vote shall be taken. Eso quiere decir, compañeros y compañeras, que ayer el Congreso, que hablando de democracia, es quien tiene que decidir, y no solo un pequeño número de delegados, sino todo el Congreso, toda la sala, como se hizo ayer, tiene que decidir, se eligió levantar la mano. No se puede decidir ahora otro tipo de voto. La Constitución dice que es o uno u otro. Artículo 18c. O uno u otro. Ayer el Congreso escogió uno. Hoy no puede cambiar las reglas. No se puede cambiar las reglas para romper la democracia, sino para crearla. Thank you very much. Uh, over there. Jam nga Shqipëria, jemi këto për të mështetër unitetin dhe demokracin, më përshtetën propozimin e felicias, jemi dhe akord. I'm from Albania, the Union of the Independent Unions of Albania, and we support the amendment of FEL-CIO, and we are here for unity and solidarity. And finally, gentlemen over here. 
Oui, bonjour, Frédéric Imbrèche de la CGT de, de France. Déjà une remarque, heureusement que nos débats ne sont pas euh, retransmis en direct sur Internet, parce qu'on donnerait une drôle d'image quand même euh, aux travailleurs du monde entier de ce qu'est le, le débat du Congrès de la CSI. C'était simplement une remarque. Plus sérieusement, plus sérieusement le, la Commission et ici beaucoup de camarades font appel à la Constitution pour considérer qu'effectivement le vote d'hier n'a pas recueilli la majorité des deux tiers. Mais je rappelle simplement, moi je ne fais même pas appel à la Constitution, je fais appel à ce que nous a dit la Commission. Sur le vote d'hier et dans, tel, dans la façon dont il s'est passé, avec le nombre d'exprimés qui s'est passé euh, euh, hier, la majorité des deux, des deux tiers n'a pas été atteinte. Donc pas, je, moi j'ai fait appel à la Constitution, mais aussi aux calculettes et à notre, à notre état d'esprit de responsabilité, parce que avec le vote d'hier, le oui l'a emporté avec 282 voix, soit 64,5%. Or, la majorité des deux tiers, c'est 66%. Donc, que l'on fasse appel à la Constitution ou au vote d'hier dans les conditions d'hier, la majorité des deux tiers n'a pas été respectée. C'est un peu comme si, que, en Angleterre, ceux qui étaient contre le Brexit demandaient un nouveau référendum pour le Brexit à vitam aeternam. Et ça, c'est pas possible. Final speaker. Türkçe adına söz aldım. Peşinme günü yeni oylamayı destekliyoruz. Okay. Everybody has said their uh, their view, and uh, I, I I I was the president in right moment, wasn't I? <laughs> Whatever I do, half the half the room will hate me. And you know, I don't like when people hate me. Um, so um, I have also the privilege as uh, serving president of the Congress to send the uh, conflict questions to the credential committee to have a further discussion. I know you don't like when I do that, and I will not do that uh, frequently. But uh, there is, uh, I, I agree with Jesus, uh, the statutes uh, say that the uh, votes will be with hands, but it also said that at least 25% of the total membership could, uh, uh, should be accepted by credential committee for a roll call. So I will send the question back to uh, credential committee to have a discussion and come up and give a uh, give a final final uh, outcome for the Congress in a... Oh, Eva, Eva is there. Is you prepared to do that, Eva? Of course. Everything you say, Kolle. But uh, also, uh, I think it would be best if uh, we could do it together with the Standing Orders Committee. Okay. So, if it's okay... Uh, Yeah. I want to consult the uh, President of Standing Orders Committee so that we together can uh, discuss this and come back to, to Congress. hope that's uh, okay with you. Give her an applaud, everybody. Hey, come on. So I'm sending a question to the Joint Commission of Standing Order and Credential. Um, thank you very much. Um, Now we try to come back to political questions for the Congress. Hope we can uh, do that for a while. And um, I would uh, start with giving the floor first to uh, Felix Anthony from Standing Orders. Felix, are you prepared? No question? Okay, very good. So then I, I will give the floor to Joshua Mata from Centro Philippines for the next panel. Joshua, are you prepared? Welcome to Congress. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, comrades. Take a breath, all together. We have, we have one way to do this, and I think this is a very, very important discussion, and I know that that was a heated debate, but we have to focus now, and there's one way to do this. And let's do this in the Filipino way. When I say, isang bagsak, don't ask what it means. When I say isang bagsak, I want everyone in an organized fashion to bang the table. Not too hard, you might break the table. But everyone should bang the table all at the same time. Let's try it. Isang bagsak! Oh, come on, we can do better than that. We are the global movement that will change the world. Isang bagsak! Let's do it again. Isang bagsak! Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we should start. We should start with a picture. 
I want to introduce to you uh, Yushi. Is a picture of Yushi coming up? Right, well, there should be a picture of Yushi. And Yushi uh, works in Addis Ababa, and is it, is it coming? And the picture is taking my time. So. <laughs> Right, well, I suppose later on we'll see a picture of Yushi. But I saw, we thought a Yushi's picture would be a good uh, starting point because Yushi is actually working in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And he's been telling us that he's been working in a company for 30 years. 30 years, three decades. And he's only, he's earning, there he is. Can you give him a warm round of applause, comrades? So Yushi tells us that he's been in a company for 30 years only, uh, earning only $20 a month. Can you just imagine, $20 a month. He said, I'm fighting so hard to feed my three children. And this is why we need to regulate the economy. And what's interesting in this panel, comrades, I'm, really not, I'm not so used to spoke, speaking behind the podium. But what's interesting about this panel is that we have four, interesting, uh, we have four powerful speakers who will share their ideas, their experiences, and the lessons that they have learned in fighting to regulate economic power. Regulating economic power is a big part of the Congress team. Change the rules. In this panel, we, we want to listen to their experiences and uh, call from them the lessons that we can use to fight and, and change the rules. And we, we need these lessons. And we need to accumulate all these lessons because we are fighting a very, very powerful enemy. Make no mistake, what we are fighting against is a system, a system that has created an architecture of power and impunity, which was designed primarily by the global elites and sconced in most cases in their nice offices inside the transnational corporations, but were engineered and built for them by the very political elites that the working class actually elects and votes in most cases. Um, and the current rule is simple. We don't have to discuss this very clearly, very thoroughly. I think there will be no debate. The rule in this system is simple. It is profits over people. It is profits over the environment. I will not explain the details of that architecture of impunity and power. I think you could, I'd, I'd invite you, if you haven't read it yet, I'd invite you to read the Congress document. And there it says and explains all the policies, all the institutions, and, all the, and everything that, that, uh, that, uh, that neoliberalism has been pushing down our throats for almost four decades now. Make no mistake, comrades. Neoliberalism is not a set of bad policies. It's a powerful ideology. And it is so powerful that despite all the errors that it made, despite all the failures that it has shown to us, it is still dominating thinking in this world. And the reason why they're able to sustain that despite their failures is because they're able to keep the poor, the powerless, and the oppressed poor, powerless, and oppressed because through violence. Violence has an economic function. And violence is there being used by the powers that be to keep everyone in check. So, changing the rules actually means changing this system. And that's going to be very difficult. Um, I understand that uh, social dialogue is in the DNA of our movement. We eat, drink, sleep, talk, breathe, social, uh, social dialogue. And I know that it is important for many people. But I think it's time to think that maybe there is something else that we need to do. Because social dialogue, for me, in my experience in the Philippines, works only if there is political parity between us and them. It works only when there is civility. Unfortunately, neoliberalism is not affording us civility at this point in time. So we need, beyond social dialogue, we need to mobilize our power. We need to start mobilizing our power, not just in the boardrooms, but out there in the streets. We need to regain control over the state and use it to dismantle the, architect, uh, the architecture of power and impunity that our enemies has crafted for us. So with that, we'll start with the panel.
and I'm going to introduce, introduce to you one uh, to you, uh, to them to you. Uh, Kim Jung Won from KCTU uh, of Korea will talk to us about their experiences in fighting Samsung. And Samsung is a global company. It's a cable that has prided itself in having a no union policy that has abused working conditions of workers and has, it even has uh, forgotten about uh, work safety. We'll hear about their struggles and about their successes and the challenges that uh, lay be, be, uh, ahead of them. We will also hear a testimony about the struggle against insecure and precarious work that has become the trademark of all global supply chains. No? Um, but, but this is great news because our unions, some of our unions are actually gaining headway and we'll listen to and we'll hear Rachel McIntosh from New Zealand, from the NZCTU, and to share to us their struggles against the zero hour contracts. We also have in our panel, um, and I hope I, I, I, hope I, I say this properly, Laurent Berger, who will talk about the success of our movement in France in making sure that multinational companies are actually accountable to whatever they do around the world. Um, uh, Brother Berger is from the CFDT, uh, and, he will, and he will explain to us how they were able to do that in France. Finally, finally we also even have in our panel Brother Gerardo Martinez from CGT Argentina. And he's going to speak about their own struggles in fighting against the IFIs. And who in this room has never had a brush against IFIs? I think all of us knows how powerful this enemy, are, enemy, is, enemy is. And Gerardo is here to testify how they do it. Comrades, please join me in welcoming them. Let's give them tatlong bagsak. Three claps. One, tatlong bagsak. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Tatlong bagsak. Excellent, thank you. S'il vous plaît. Donc, 여러분, 반갑습니다. 감사합니다. 한국은 2016년 말부터 5개월 동안 광장을 뜨겁게 달구었던 촛불 운동을 전개했습니다. 기억하실 겁니다. 그 결과로 부패한 대통령뿐만이 아니라 세계 초일류 기업 삼성 이재용 부회장도 구속되었습니다. 법원이 인정한 뇌물 공여의 대가가 총수일가 3세인 이재용의 불법 경영권 승계라는 점을 온 국민이 알게 되었습니다. 감옥에서 풀려난 이재용 회장이 부회장이 최근에는 또 다른 회계 조작을 통한 경영권 승계 작업을 자행했음이 드러나서 불법적인 이러한 행위가 일상적임을 보여주고 있습니다. 삼성을 비롯한 재벌 대기업들과 정치 권력의 유착은 역사적으로 유래가 깊습니다. 재벌은 일제의 적산을 불화받아 탄생했고 특혜로 미국 원조금을 그리고 또한 군부가 주도한 개발 독재의 하이퍼트너가 되어서 성장했습니다. 한국의 1997년 외환위기 이후에 금융 세계화에 편입해서 초국적 기업이 되었습니다. 한국 재벌 대기업은 바로 글로벌 기업으로 만든 경쟁력이 바로 저임금 장시간 노동으로 그런 것을 이루었습니다. 한국 재벌의 무한 착취의 비결은 무노조 경영. 이것은 단순히 노조가 없어서 무노조 경영이 아닙니다. 일상적인 노동자들에 대한 감시 그리고 노조 혐오 분위기를 조성하고 그리고 노조 결성 사전 차단과 노조 파괴를 일삼으며 한국의 노동 기본권 자체를 아예 철저히 부정하고 있습니다. 바로 삼성이 그렇습니다. 대를 이어서 80년간 지속되던 삼성의 무노조 정책은 결국 삼성의 전직 현직 임원들 32명에 대한 형사 기소로 규결되었습니다. 삼성은 노조 설립 자체를 악성 바이러스로 침투로 규정하고 이를 예방하는 데 총력을 기울였습니다. 개별 면담을 통해 노조 탈퇴를 종용하고 그리고 반노조 그리고 차별 행위들을 저행하였으며 조합원이 있는 협력업체들과는 폐업을 시켰습니다. 또한 사찰을 통해 취득한 개인 정보를 이용한 회유 이 모든 노조 파괴에 또한 공작에 대한 총 컨트롤 타워는 바로 삼성그룹의 핵심인 미래 전략실이었습니다. 바로 이렇게 조직 범죄와도 같았던 노조 파괴 공작에도 삼성전자 서비스 노동자들은 국계 단결해서 즐겁게 투쟁했습니다. 그 결과 삼성은 
더 이상 무노조 기업이 아닙니다. 삼성은 결국 노조를 교섭 파트너로 인정했고 지난 11월 초 8천여 명의 노동자를 직접 고용하기로 협의하였습니다. 금성노조 삼성전자 서비스 지회는 바로 조합원들을 500명에서 2,500명으로 확대했습니다. 그러나 삼성에서 노동기본권 확장을 위한 투쟁은 바로 이제 시작입니다. 또한 삼성이 자신의 왕국인 바로 삼성 안에서 무노조 정책을 고수하는 동안 반도체 공장의 노동자들은 백혈병을 비롯한 각종 직업병으로 목숨을 잃어갔습니다. 2007년 급성 백혈, 백혈병으로 사망한 삼성 반도체 노동자 황유미 씨의 아버지 황상기 씨가 11령 투쟁 끝에 지난 11월 23일 삼성전자 대표이사가 반도체 사업장에서 발생한 백혈병 환자와 가족들에게 공식 사과를 받아 냈습니다. 삼성의 뒤늦은 사과에 황상기 씨는 삼성은 국내에서 그리고 해외에서 노동조합을 할 권리를 존중하고 그리고 또한 그것을 약속해야 한다고 했습니다. 노동조합이 없이는 직업병의 효과적 예방도 작업장에서의 위험한 물질에 대한 노동자들의 알 권리도 실현될 수 없습니다. 동지 여러분, 동지 여러분과 함께 삼성에게 이러한 메시지를 전달하고 싶습니다. 삼성의 이윤을 위해 죽어 마땅한 사람은 없습니다. 삼성의 글로벌 공급 사슬 전반에서 노조할 권리를 보장하라. 함께 해 주시기 바랍니다. 삼성의 이윤을 위해 죽어 마땅한 사람은 없다. 삼성의 글로벌 공급 사슬 전반에서 노조할 권리를 보장하라. 고맙습니다. 인더스트리얼 media and political strands all worked together to achieve the end of zero hour contracts. The industrial thread was the base and the most important. Unite, the union, had a foothold in major fast food brands. They identified brand sensitivity as a lever to influence those big companies. Unite Union is the union of fast food and it is the place where many young workplace leaders have their first experience of union. The best way to understand union power is to experience it and those people are feeding our movement this, to this day. So industrially there were three fast food giants, McDonald's, you may have heard of them, Burger King and restaurant brands were due to be in bargaining all at the same time so this was a chance for maximum impact. The union planned a day of action before the bargaining started to set the scene. And on the 14th of February 2015, St Valentine's Day, we felt the love. And this was an international day of action. We had actions all across our country and they were boosted by solidarity actions in Korea, the Philippines, Hong Kong and Indonesia. All New Zealand unions and many international unions stood in solidarity and set the scene for bargaining. So when the bargaining started, the company where the union was the strongest very quickly settled and agreed to end zero hour contracts. Others followed until in the end McDonald's was the only holdout. And a couple of months later even McDonald's agreed to end zero hours. All of which sounds very easy. But there are a couple of other strands that were very important. So the media strand was vital to this campaign. Interest had been building with national, regional newspapers running stories for several months, stories that had been fed by Unite Union, stories from real workers' lives in our country. And then following that day of action, 
the largest, most high-rating national news TV program essentially joined our campaign. And we had drive-through customers of McDonald's on national TV condemning zero hours as being unjust. The political thread was also important. The government of the day was conservative, very anti-union and very anti-worker. But opposition politicians promised to address the issue and they were beginning to get traction. So the combined pressure of the industrial and the media and the political persuaded the conservative government of the day eventually to change the law to outlaw zero hour contracts where people had to be available and sit at home with no certainty and no wages. It was a pretty major victory and we had some international recognition of that. The Zero Hours campaign caused real improvement in the working lives of fast food workers and it gave our movement hope and it gave it heart and it became one of many aspects of our union building to make a difference in people's lives, including aged care, home support and other low paid areas where New Zealand working people are standing up in union to make a difference in our lives and in the lives of working people. Solidarity. Bonjour chers amis, chers camarades. Après le drame du Rana Plaza qui a coûté la vie à 1127 ouvriers et ouvrières dans une usine textile du Bangladesh en avril 2013, et grâce à d'intenses mobilisations de la CFDT, de la CGT et des ONG, la France a enfin adopté en mars 2017 une loi sur le devoir de vigilance des multinationales. L'adoption de cette loi constitue à l'évidence une avancée historique dans la responsabilisation des multinationales. C'est aussi, selon nous, une étape importante pour une mondialisation plus juste. La vision que nous portons depuis longtemps sur l'économie et l'entreprise implique que les entreprises assument une responsabilité sociale et sociétale, englobant une responsabilité environnementale. Cela suppose l'existence de régulations fortes, qu'elles soient mondiales ou nationales, ou encore mises en œuvre au sein même des entreprises par le biais de l'action syndicale quotidienne. La loi crée une obligation juridiquement contraignante pour les sociétés mères et les entreprises donneuses d'ordre. Elles vont devoir rendre des comptes quant au respect des droits humains, des libertés fondamentales et de l'environnement sous peine d'être sanctionnées. C'est une étape importante dans la prévention des atteintes aux droits humains et à l'environnement par les multinationales. Cela concerne non seulement leur propre activité, mais aussi celle des sociétés qu'elles qu contrôlent ainsi que les activités de leurs sous-traitants et fournisseurs avec lesquels elles entretiennent une relation commerciale. Les entreprises visées par la loi devront établir et rendre public un plan de vigilance et aussi le mettre en œuvre. Identifier les risques, c'est le travail syndical prioritaire auquel doivent s'attacher nos équipes dans les entreprises. Tout d'abord en France, par le biais de cette loi, mais aussi dans les filiales, chez les sous-traitants ou fournisseurs concernés dans le reste du monde. La deuxième priorité est de réussir à faire fonctionner un mécanisme d'alerte et de recueil des signalements à propos des risques potentiels et des atteintes aux droits. Évaluer la situation des filiales, des sous-traitants ou fournisseurs, suivre les mesures mises en œuvre et évaluer leur efficacité. C'est pour les syndicalistes que nous sommes une véritable opportunité de développer ou de renforcer le dialogue social national, mais surtout de développer un dialogue social transnational efficace et porteur de résultats concrets pour les travailleurs et les sociétés dans lesquelles ils vivent. La CFDT se fixe pour objectif d'associer le plus grand nombre à l'élaboration des plans de vigilance, à leur mise en œuvre et à leur suivi. Nous devrons pour cela avec les fédérations syndicales internationales, mais aussi via notre travail de coopération avec les régionales de la CSI, développer un travail syndical transnational 
avec les représentants syndicaux des filiales, des sous-traitants et des fournisseurs. C'est ce type de coopération qui donne tout au sens au syndicalisme international que nous voulons tous construire ici. Je l'ai dit, cette loi sur les devoirs de vigilance permet d'acter juridiquement le fait que des entreprises multinationales ne doivent pas poursuivre, poursuivre uniquement des objectifs de rentabilité économique, au mépris du respect des droits humains et de l'environnement. Ces activités doivent s'inscrire dans une démarche de développement durable, où les préoccupations d'ordre social et environnemental ont toute leur place, aux côtés des préoccupations d'ordre économique. Elle représente la réponse la plus ambitieuse à ce jour aux lacunes en matière d'obligation pour les multinationales de respecter les droits humains et l'environnement. Mais il faut aller plus loin, vouloir réguler les conditions d'accès d'activité, vouloir réguler les conditions d'activité des multinationales pour garantir le respect et les conditions de travail décentes tout au long de leur chaîne de valeur, impose de penser les régulations à l'échelle internationale. Un pays comme la France ou un continent comme l'Europe peuvent jouer un rôle d'entraînement, mais cela sera grandement insuffisant. Il est donc important de continuer d'agir ensemble en faveur de l'adoption de mécanismes contraignants sur la responsabilité sociétale et environnementale des entreprises aux échelles régionales ainsi qu'à l'échelle internationale. Les syndicats et plus largement la société civile internationale sont extrêmement mobilisés autour des négociations pour élaborer un traité onusien contraignant sur les multinationales et les droits humains. Ainsi, l'Alliance pour un traité rassemble aujourd'hui plus de 900 organisations dans le monde. La CSI est partie prenante de cette démarche. La CFDT est intervenue auprès des autorités françaises pour qu'elles agissent enfin en faveur de l'adoption de ce traité contraignant. Nous attendons tous un débouché positif de ces négociations. Gageons que la loi française sur le devoir de vigilance ne restera pas l'exception et faisons en sorte que toute la CSI s'engage dans cette voie. Je vous remercie. Buenos días, compañeras, compañeros. Saludo también a la mesa que conduce este Congreso Soberano. Voy a hablar del impacto y lo que significa algo que todos conocemos, algunos por las noticias y otros por las realidades que generan nuestros países, que es el Fondo Monetario Internacional. Quiero decirles que para hablar desde lo que sucede en nuestra América Latina, Centroamérica y Caribe, eh, la realidad es que desde el 2003, más o menos, vivíamos nuevos vientos, vientos progresistas, vientos donde nos encontrábamos que la mirada política de la mayoría de los líderes que representaban los derechos de nuestra democracia expresaban, más allá de algunos matices que no coincidíamos, una valoración de lo que significaba el diálogo y una mirada de la política al servicio de los intereses de los más pobres y fundamentalmente de los trabajadores y del diálogo social. En aquel momento se daban acontecimientos políticos donde nadie de los que formaban parte de la visión política y de, los, de las condiciones sociolaborales pensábamos que estábamos muy lejos de lo que había sucedido en nuestra región en la década del 90, en lo que significaba el consenso, el consenso de Washington y las medidas monetarias impuestas por el Fondo Monetario Internacional. Muchos de esos líderes políticos, y particularmente de Argentina, a partir del 2003, nos tomamos la decisión en un diálogo sustentable, político y sociolaboral, de alejarnos de todas esas recetas monetarias, generar un modelo de desarrollo productivo recreando el mercado interno, la economía con una visión de generar la economía real, eh, buscando la inserción social, es decir, promoviendo el desarrollo de nuestras industrias y de nuestros mercados y generando la oportunidad para que muchos de nuestros argentinos de, y muchos de nuestros de América Latina, como es el ejemplo de lo que hoy 
justamente reivindicamos de la experiencia de Brasil con el compañero Lula como presidente, damos la oportunidad de cambiar sistemáticamente la historia estructural, social y económica de nuestros países. Así es como en Argentina, que es la, la, la, digamos, la, la nación que nosotros representamos de la Confederación General de Trabajo y también de las distintas centrales sindicales de la CTA, trabajamos mancomunadamente justamente en reivindicar esa visión estratégica de recrear el mercado interno, el desarrollo productivo, es decir, este, la cultura del trabajo. Sin embargo, a partir del 2015 tuvimos un golpe muy particular, un golpe dentro de la democracia, diciéndolo con mucho respeto, donde el voto de la mayoría de nuestros conciudadanos daban la oportunidad de que llegara un gobierno de derecha a conducir el país. A partir de ahí nosotros observamos de una manera con mucha angustia que íbamos a encontrarnos nuevamente con una mirada y una visión económica de insertarnos en el mundo, pero desde una visión económica de derecha, con una, aceptando las condiciones del monetarismo, aceptando las condiciones de los poderosos y fundamentalmente de las reglas que se establecen dentro del mundo eh, financiero. Todos sabemos que cuando el, el, G, el G20 se, se reconstituye a partir del 2007-2008 fue justamente porque el sistema financiero había, implo, había, había explotado, había una implosión mundial, muchos de los recursos de los estados nacionales, los recursos públicos tanto en Europa como en América, tenían que salir al salvataje para justamente recorrer, digamos, reivindicar o poner en vigencia el sistema financiero mundial. Esa situación es, yo la digo, para trasladarla de lo que sucedía en este momento en Argentina a partir del 2015, donde nuevamente en recetas económicas con una mirada estratégica neoliberal ponía nuevamente a Argentina al borde de caer en las garras del Fondo Monetario Internacional. El movimiento sindical empezó a reaccionar, tanto del movimiento sindical y de todos los movimientos sociales, en forma autónoma, en forma soberana, tuvimos acciones concretas de ganando la calle, movilizando, repudiando y rechazando las medidas económicas, macroeconómicas que se disponían en el gobierno de Argentina. Veíamos que ese camino nos llevaba nuevamente a una situación de caer en las garras del Fondo Monetario Internacional. La reacción del sindicalismo y de los movimientos sociales, acompañados por mucha fuerza política, se hacían sentir en la movilización y ganando en la movilización el peso político del reclamo de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras en nuestro país, pero lamentablemente... A partir del 2017 caímos en las garras del, 2000, del Fondo Monetario Internacional. Por supuesto, el sindicalismo reaccionó en forma total al unísono en la unidad de la acción, promovimos distintas acciones, medidas fuerzas, es decir, paros, lo que nosotros en Argentina llamamos paros, huelgas generales que fueron acompañadas no solamente por nuestra sociedad asalariada, sino también por el conjunto de los ciudadanos que pertenecen a actividades no convencionales, no sindicalizadas, se vieron, se vieron de alguna manera representadas por la decisión que llevaba adelante el movimiento sindical. ¿Qué les voy a contar? Lo que significa la receta monetaria, es verdad que hay un maquillaje diferente, con un estilo diferente que tiene el Fondo Monetario Internacional, pero tal cual como sucedió en Europa, por dar un ejemplo en Grecia, también en Argentina, las pretensiones del Fondo Monetario Internacional, este organismo multilateral de inversión que representa los grandes grupos transnacionales, lo único que hace que imponer una receta de ajuste y donde no todos tenemos que asumir la misma responsabilidad. Ellos pretenden que los trabajadores y los jubilados sean los que asuman la responsabilidad del ajuste que ellos pretenden imponer con su receta. Estamos en una lucha constante y permanente, 
vamos a decirle que no al Fondo Monetario Internacional y a todas estas recetas que se quieren imponer. Estamos latentes en un programa de acción y movilización permanente de todo el movimiento sindical. Por lo tanto, compañeros, lo que queremos es contar con la solidaridad de todo el movimiento sindical mundial. Por supuesto, en nuestras Américas estamos actuando de la misma manera, acompañando también solidariamente la lucha que hace el movimiento sindical en Brasil y en otros países de nuestra región. En Chile también tenemos una situación de un gobierno derecha, estamos ahí acompañando la lucha que lleva adelante los compañeros de la CUT de Chile y así permanentemente trabajando en forma mancomunada para demostrar y levantar con fortaleza la reivindicación del salario digno de la justicia social y de que haya diálogo social estructural con la discusión de paritaria, es decir, de convenios colectivos de nuestro país. Eso no se negocia y la condición fundamental que nosotros determinamos desde el movimiento sindical en Argentina es ni un paso atrás, ni un paso atrás y seguir en la lucha, en la defensa de nuestros derechos, de nuestras reivindicaciones, de nuestro jubilado y de lo que significa la cultura del trabajo. Muchas gracias. So please, please, Joshua, do you want to say something in the end? Joshua? No? Okay, then I think we thank uh, the panel with a huge applause for their very important contribution to the Congress. Okay, then we will continue with the, the debate on the floor. And um, I have, uh, as you can imagine now, a lot of names. Uh, names from uh, remi remaining from yesterday and new names for the debate that starts now. And uh, we tried this morning to make a mixture of, uh, of the two lists, so we have a good possibility for as many speakers as possible. I have all the names here, but obviously you know that already when we start the Congress, we will not fit in everybody uh, right now this morning. So as many as possible. And one way of having as many as possible, I repeat that. I will not accept speeches over four minutes. I have a weapon here, and I will use it directly. So four minutes, that's the and then the end. Uh, now we start the debate, and I start with my, uh, my fantastic colleague, uh, the Deputy President Maria, Maria Fernando from, uh, from Angola. The floor is yours, Maria. And she can also have applause, actually. Hey, come on. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Como moza a tarefa de iniciar este debate onde o tema principal tem uma relação direta não apenas com as mulheres, mas sobretudo com o povo do meu continente. Eu venho de África e quando abordamos questões económicas, o nosso principal alvo nos debates sindicais tem sido apenas as questões ligadas aos fóruns globais. Na nossa opinião, quando abordamos questões económicas, devemos fundamentalmente prestar uma atenção especial ao facto de que nós, as mulheres, nós, as mulheres de África, maioritariamente trabalhamos no setor informal. Nós somos o rosto da pobreza. Nós somos aquele grupo, alvo, que mais padece hoje no mundo. A maioria das mulheres africanas trabalham no setor informal, não têm um salário digno, não têm um emprego, não temos proteção social. Nós somos o grupo que, quando se trata, começamos o debate sobre as questões sindicais, quando começamos o debate sobre as questões económicas, devemos ser a prioridade. Por isso, venho até aqui ao pódio apelar a que durante os debates deste Congresso se preste uma atenção especial 
as mulheres africanas. As mulheres africanas são a maioria no seu continente e também são aquelas que mais problemas têm no mercado de trabalho. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, so then we start uh, with India. Harbayan Singh. You have four minutes, Harbayan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Arbhajan Singh Sidhu. I am the General Secretary of the Hind Madhur Sabha, one of the National Center of India, representing 9.2 million workforce of my country. On the outset, uh, I would like to thank ITUC for selecting the most relevant theme for the Fourth World Congress, that is the building workers' power, change the rule, as all the burning issues of working masses circle around the theme. And uh, Congress has also endorsed four pillars of action after, after consulting all the affiliates. Number one, peace, democracy, and rights. Ending corporate greed. Number three, global shifts, just transition. Equ fourth, equality. Fifth, the denial of rights to workers have been noticed in the countries with a rating five on global right index, which uh, include India. First of all, I thank the ITUC General Secretary while she was uh, pre presenting their, her report. He mentioned the Indian trade union movement struggle because from last so many years, all the national centers of India except the ruling party labor wing. We are fighting against the anti-labor policies of the government of India. And uh, we had a very successful four strike in, in our country. And uh, because the government has decided to convert all labor-friendly labor laws into the four code in favor of uh, co big corporate house and multinationals. And the uh, government has decided to change the Factory Act. They have increased the number of employees from 10 to 20 where power is used, and 20 to 40 where power is not used. There will be no inspection of any labor ministry. The, that area is free for the employer, and there is no need to employer to submit there any return to the labor ministry. Only self-certification of the employer is sufficient and there, there will be no protection of uh, working hours, there will be no protection of uh, occupational health and safety, and all the workers are working even uh, below the minimum wage. There is no freedom of association, they cannot form the union, there, there, is, a, there is a no question of uh, collective bargaining, they are uh, working just like uh, slaves, duty hours, government is proposing to change from 10, uh, 10 to 12 hours. These, uh, on these demands, all, uh, Ten national centers have decided to go on strike in the month of January on 8 and 9 for two days. And uh, all our civilian defense employees, they have also decided to go on uh, three-day strike in the month of January on 23rd, 24th, 25th. And all other sector employees, just like Indian Railways and uh, coal, bank insurance, road transport, power employees, they, they, they are also on the road, they are also str struggling, fighting against the anti-labor policies of the government of India. And uh, I'm happy to say that General Secretary ITUC mentioned that uh, ITUC will support the uh, demands of the Indian trade union movement. And uh, ITUC will also visit India in the next month uh, when uh, there will be a two-day strike on 8 and 9. But uh, I am also mentioned here that uh, in the past, uh, General Secretary has decided to visit India along with the other two colleagues, Brother Yap and uh, uh, Soya, General Secretary I2CAP, and uh, they organized a press conference there. Um, uh, General Secretary addressed the Indian press conference and uh, issued a press, uh, a press statement there, and uh, she met uh, all the natural center of the India, 
And uh, I'm sorry to mention here that Indian government uh, ordered an inquiry, and in that inquiry, Indian, Indian government passed an order that uh, in future, the entry of the General Secretary ITUC and entry of the YAP Deputy General Secretary and uh, entry of the General Secretary ITUC AP uh, banned in, in India. This is, this is the democracy, all four, four pillars we have identified. Uh, and uh, the Indian government is working on that, that type of anti-labor attitude. And uh, we, at this moment, uh, all the national center representing 500 million workforce of the India, demanding to the uh, India, Indian Congress that there should be a regulation in favor of uh, uh, Indian workers and there should be a um, uh, regulation against the Indian government who is taking uh, anti-labor and uh, anti... Um, uh, yeah, thank up. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's uh, Hans Christian Gabrielsson from Ello, Norway. And uh, next speaker, please be prepared so we don't have to wait for the long walk to the podium. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, friends. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our Danish, Danish colleagues for organizing this Congress. Uh, and I would also like to thank you for uh, the lovely reception we had uh, yesterday in uh, Tivoli. Uh, great thanks also to the ITUC staff for their hard work. And also a great thank to Sharon for her strong message from the podium yesterday morning. The last four years, we have uh, witnessed um, an improvement in the ITUC's coordination of various UN meetings, such as the Commission of the Status of Women, the International Labour Conference, and uh, many others. And this work and the follow-up on the SDGs is crucial to ensure that workers' issues are being addressed and we hope that the ITUC will uh, further strengthen this work. Dear friends, for many years, ELO Norway has been working closely with the Palestinian labor movement in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Unfortunately, 25 years after the first Oslo Accord, there is a loss of hope, both in the occupied territories and internationally. According to the ILO, um, unemployment has reached the highest level in the world and Gaza is in the midst of a man-made humanitarian crisis. Settlement building is continuing and intensifying. Most of the land remains ethically off-limits for, for uh, Palestinians. Moreover, Israel is passing or advancing new legislation damaging to basic human rights and laws affecting Palestinian rights to self-determination. Brothers and sisters, the uh, political, economic and humanitarian situation is serious. And as dialogue uh, and resolutions have had no effect, our Congress in uh, 2017 concluded that uh, the efforts now must be directed towards an international, economical, cultural and academic boycott of Israel to achieve our goals. Ella Norway would therefore like to see the international trade union movement strengthen its commitment towards safeguarding the respect for international law and human rights law. Brothers and sisters, it's time to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, 217. Very, very good. And we have twice as many speakers. Um, now we go further on to South Africa. Kosato, Becky, floor is yours. Thank you, Comrade Chair, and good morning. I wanted to make a comment <clears throat> in regard to the statement made yesterday, peace, democracy, and the rights. Firstly, we support the statement or the resolution of the Congress, but wanted to make some following remarks that we don't seem to, to appear in the, in the report. The first one is in relation to the rise of the right wing, the demagogues and the populist, which we see to be growing particularly in Europe and in the Latin America. The question that we think this Congress should be asking is why our people 
are voting for these people that we seem not to like. And the conclusion we make <clears throat> is that the governments that we have, the democratic government that we have, have failed our people. And as long as we don't address that one, comrades and the people are going to look for solutions somewhere else. That's the first point we want to make, and we need some discussion. The second one is relating to the question that has been raised about the question of guns and weapons. That these guns and bullets are made by workers themselves. And we know that they are made to kill people, and we seem not to have a debate on them. The third point is in regard to the Palestine. We want to appeal to this Congress that they must direct the first general council to determine an international solidarity day for the Palestinian people. And in the same wavelength, we want to appeal to the trade unions in Israel that their voice has to be very clear and be heard, that they oppose what government is doing in Palestine. The fourth issue is in relation to the amendment to the Brazilian uh, point 64, that we wanted to make this arrangement, uh, amendment, that the Congress will never respect and recognize the government of Barisano until he withdraws the infirmary attacks on women, on black people, on gay people, on foreigners, indigenous community, and we must demand that he must release President Lula. The last one is in regard to the amendment in reference to the trade union's right. Our suggestion is that whenever we refer to the trade union rights, it must be coupled by the workers' right. Secondly, in relation to the violence against women as a vulnerable uh, people, we suggest that we must add violence against women and children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we move forward on to uh, South Korea, F FKTU, Kim Yu Yong. Thank you very much. I am the President of the United Kim Juyong입니다. 먼저 지난 4년간 노동자의 권익 보호에 헌신해 온 ITUC의 ITUC에 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 근본 총회가 강조하는 것처럼 지금은 위기를 맞이한 사회 규율을 새롭게 바꿔야 할 때입니다. 불평등을 심화시키고 노동자들을 소외시켜 온 실패한 제도들을 걷어내고 이제 우리는 인권과 노동권, 사회 정의가 보장되는 새로운 사회 계약을 구현해야 합니다. 무엇보다 중요한 것은 기업의 탐욕이 불러온 유연하고 불안한 노동을 없애고 양질의 일자리를 확보하는 것. 다시 말해 노동을 존중하는 사회로의 전환이 이루어져야만 합니다. 지난해 한국에서는 노동자를 억압하던 부패한 정권이 물러나고 노동 존중 사회 실현을 표방한 새 대통령이 당선되었습니다. 새로운 정부는 최저임금을 대폭 인상하고 노동시간을 단축하며 공공부분의 비정규직을 정기직화하는 등 노동이 존중받는 사회로 한 걸음 다가가려는 노력들을 보여주었습니다. 그러나 최근에는 사용자들의 요구대로 최저임금 산입 범위를 확대함으로써 최저임금 인상 효과를 반감시키고 연장 근로수당을 지급하지 않고도 장시간 노동을 가능케 하는 탄력 근로제 확대를 시도하는 등 정부와 여당의 노동 존중 정책이 점점 후퇴하고 있습니다. 뿐만 아니라 아예로 핵심 협약을 비준하고 노조할 권리를 보장하겠다던 약속은 아직도 지켜지지 않고 있습니다. 지난해 한국노총은 산적한 노동 현안들을 대화로 풀기 위해 멈춰있던 사회적 대화를 재개하자는 제안을 하였고 그 결과 새롭게 재편한 사회적 대화기구가 지난 11월 22일 출범하였습니다. 한국노총은 사회적 대화를 통해 국민과 노동자의 삶에 막대한 영향을 미치는 사안들을 해결하고 우리 사회의 많은 모순과 갈등을 풀어내고자 합니다. 
특히 노동자의 권익보호를 위해서는 무엇보다 시급한 문제들을 우선적으로 해결할 것입니다. 물론 대화만으로 모든 것을 해결할 수는 없기에 한국노총은 노동자의 힘은 조직에서 나온다는 가장 기본적이지만 가장 중요한 원칙 아래 조직화에 매진하고 있습니다. 업종, 고용 형태 등에 관계없이 비정규직, 사내하층 노동자, 특수고용 노동자 등 미조직 노동자를 조직하는 데 최선을 다하고 있으며 이러한 노력이 조금씩 성과로 나타나고 있습니다. 지난 7월 문호조 경영으로 비난을 받아온 삼성의 자회사에 노조를 설립함은 물론 지난 50년간 사측의 반노동조합 정서와 부당노동 행위로 정상적인 노동활동이 이루어지지 못했던 포스코에도 6천 명이 넘는 조합원을 새로 조직하기에 이르렀습니다. 뿐만 아니라 노동상권과 4대 보험 혜택을 보장받지 못했던 특수고용 노동자들인 보험설계사 노조도 설립하였습니다. 앞으로 기술발전과 기후변화 등이 본격적으로 도래하게 되면 이 일의 미래에 초래될 변화도 심상치 않을 것으로 예상됩니다. 이 일의 정의, 방식, 장소에 이르기까지 많은 변화가 일어날 것입니다. 따라서 노동조합은 다양한 형태의 노동을 보호하고 조직하는 것에 빠르게 대응해야 합니다. 이에 실패한다면 우리는 더욱 심각한 양극화와 불평등을 맞게 될지도 모릅니다. 따라서 전 세계 노동자가 뭉쳐 노동자의 희생만을 강요하는 기업의 부당한 탐욕을 종식시키고 포용적 성장의 털 속에서 모두가 소외되지 않고 다 같이 함께 갈수 있는 길을 모색해야만 합니다. 그리고 그것은 노동자의 단결과 힘이 있다면 가능할 것입니다. ITUC를 중심으로 한 보다 강력한 연대와 조직 확대를 통한 노동자의 역량 구축을 토대로 사람과 노동자가 중심이 되는 정의로운 사회로 전환을 이끌어내는데 한국노총이 함께하겠습니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to the host of the Congress, LO President of Denmark, Lisette Rieskog. Thank you. Dear sisters and brothers, please listen very carefully. Today we will discuss to how to change economic balance of power. I wish to launch an initiative to develop an international trade union declaration against tax evasion. The sad fact is that the greed of large global corporations has made tax evasion and tax fraud an economic practice of epic proportions at our expense. Through the Panama Papers, journalists have relieved the enormous, enormous extent of organized tax fraud and have documented that both companies, banks, lawyers, and other tax advisors take advantage of the lack of control with tax evasion. This cannot go on. It is an area where we have to change. We have to change the economic power balance. Those responsible for this theft of taxpayers' money should be held accountable. And they must be prevented from ever continuing their criminal activities. The international trade union movement, movement must take the lead in this fight. And in S and in the national as well as the international level. Let me give you one alarming example of what we're talking about. Recently, we saw how speculators cynically robbed public treasuries in a number of European countries. This robbery amounted to 50 billion euros stemming from false refunds for corporate tax paid. I don't know about you, but I personally, I'm offended and I'm very angry. Not at least because this robbery happened at the same time as austerity policies were bringing public services to their knees in many countries. In addition to being a crime, tax evasion is so widespread that it's a threat 
to the welfare of ordinary workers. The UN has put forward 17 global goals for sustainable development towards uh, 2030. These goals aim to end world poverty and hunger, reduce inequality and ensure good education and better health care for everyone, decent job and sustainable economic growth. This will require massive investments in education, social security, infrastructure and climate protection measures. These inc include public investments based on tax revenue and fair and effective tax systems. We need a change. This is why I invite all of you to support the development of a declaration to fight international tax evasion. I have five concrete suggestions. One, national tax authorities must allocate the necessary resources to fight international tax evasion. Two, an international supervisory authority should be set up, drawing inspiration from Interpol. Necessary resources must be provided, both in terms of manpower and legal capacity. And three, increasing country-by-country country reporting by extending the reporting obligation to more companies, and four firmer sanctions against tax havens who do not cooperate on transparency and fair taxation. A sanction could be blacklisting or tax resource payment to blacklist countries. And then five, the OECDs should strengthen cooperation to fight against tax crime and implement the 10 global principles for fighting tax crime. This is the starting point, so I invite you to contribute with your ideas, and I hope that the ITUC will coordinate these efforts. So, colleagues and friends, fighting the international tax evasion is vital in order to change economic balance of power. I thank you. Thank you for your commitment and your support. I didn't have the heart to... Uh to take her down. Now, uh, next one is FGTP Belgium, Robert Vertinui. Sorry about the. Robert Vertinui de la FGTP Belgique. Bien, mes chers camarades, chers amis, je vous dois vous avouer que je suis un peu mal à l'aise. Mal à l'aise parce que nous avions dit au Conseil général qu'il y aurait une certaine confusion à mélanger le débat sur le rapport d'activité et sur les perspectives d'avenir. Je dois constater que depuis hier, nous sommes effectivement un peu dans la confusion. Alors vous m'en excuserez, mais en ce, qui en, est, bon, en ce qui me concerne, je souhaite revenir effectivement sur le rapport d'activité et sur le thème d'hier, à savoir la démocratie, et en particulier de la démocratie interne à notre organisation. Et malheureusement, je ne suis pas sûr que nous avons montré nous-mêmes le meilleur exemple de respect de la démocratie à l'intérieur de notre organisation. Comme le disait mon camarade de la CGT France tout à l'heure, si un de nos délégués d'entreprise avait dû assister à la pantalonnade à laquelle nous avons assisté ce matin, je ne suis pas sûr qu'il aurait été fier de ses porte paroles De remettre en cause un vote après qu'il ait eu lieu, alors qu'il n'y a même pas été demandé au demand où on dépose l'amendement un vote nominal, relève de la manipulation et de la confiscation de la démocratie. C'est inacceptable, selon moi. Mais plus encore, qu'avons-nous constaté hier Une absence de traitement équitable et de véritable débat entre les, pro les projets politiques portés par les deux candidats, ce qui est pourtant essentiel pour la démocratie et l'avenir dans notre organisation. À la place, nous avons vu un grand déséquilibre dans le temps de parole des deux candidates pour pouvoir présenter leurs projets politiques, sans compter que la réplique de Sharon était pour le moins inélégante et mal placée. Cette situation vient de la confusion entretenue, comme je le disais tout à l'heure, de manière permanente, entre la discussion sur le rapport d'activité et la discussion sur nos résolutions pour les quatre années à venir. Par rapport au débat d'hier, je voudrais revenir sur la discussion sur l'OIT et le droit de grève pour y apporter quelques nuances. Combien de fois avons-nous demandé au Conseil général d'avoir une discussion sur la stratégie à adopter face à l'offensive patronale à l'OIT visant justement à remettre en cause le droit de grève le rapport est silencieux à ce sujet. Il ne dit pas non plus 
Il ne dit pas non plus qu'un accord a été signé avec les employeurs en février 2015 dans lequel on reconnaît le droit de lockout aux employeurs, c'est inacceptable. Ce que les organes de supervision d'ailleurs de l'OIT s'étaient pourtant toujours à refuser eux-mêmes à faire. De même, nous nous inquiétons des propositions qui mettent en danger le rôle majeur et la crédibilité du comité des experts de l'OIT, comité qui doit pourtant interpréter les conventions, y compris sur la question fondamentale du droit grève. Dans le même ordre, prenons le lancement de l'indice CSI des droits dans le monde. La décision d'établir un tel indice et un classement entre pays mériterait à coup sûr un examen, une discussion approfondie entre nous et surtout une décision formelle de nos instances. Mais ça n'a pas été le cas. D'autres exemples pourraient encore être cités, mais le président a décidé d'accorder quatre minutes réelles à mon temps d'intervention. Alors, j'en viendrai tout de suite à ma conclusion, mes camarades. Sans nier qu'il y ait eu des choses positives, le faire serait contraire à la vérité. Sans nier qu'il y ait eu des choses positives qui ont été faites, nous considérons que la CSI a besoin d'un projet politique porté par une nouvelle équipe capable de revenir aux principes fondamentaux de démocratie interne, de transparence et de bonne gouvernance. Les trois sont liés, l'un ne va pas sans l'autre. Pour cela, il faut que la CI soit rendue à ses affiliés, à tous ses affiliés. Il n'y a que comme cela que nous pourrons faire face aux défis de manière unie durant les quatre ans qui viennent. Nous avons besoin d'une équipe, nous avons besoin d'une équipe avec à sa tête un leader, pas d'une vedette, pas d'une showwoman. Mes amis, le travail syndical sera toujours inachevé comme d'autres. Il nous faudra sans cesse, il nous faudra sans cesse remettre le métier sur le travail. Il nous faut à chaque fois réparer ce que l'usure du temps et la folie des hommes détruit. Alors mes camarades, j'ai foi dans une nouvelle équipe, une nouvelle équipe qui sera dirigée par Susanna Cabousso. Beaucoup ont parlé d'unité, je n'y dérogerai pas. À la FGTB, nous disons ensemble, on est plus fort. Alors, salut et fraternité, camarades. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, we will now go further on to AFL-CO, United States. Tefia Gabre, the floor is yours. Good morning, sisters and brothers. I'm here before you today asking that we change the rules of our economy. Currently, the rules are written by corporations for corporations. What does that mean? It means we must rewrite the rules of global trade and we must demand that global, global trade agreements put workers at the center, not at side agreements. We must, brothers and sisters, change the rules of our economy, not play just on the edges. Every time we try to play by the rules written by them, we actually are on the menu, not at the table. Sisters and brothers, when we come together as workers, when we demand we're at the table, when we demand that we get what our labor is worth, we actually can achieve change. And that includes valuing anybody who shows up to work as a human being and as a worker not as a native born or as an immigrant. At the workplace, brothers and sisters, we have to be one and we have to stand up for each other. Changing the rules means no longer allowing corporations to write the rules that allow them to pollute our environment and to pollute our politics. Brothers and sisters, this morning, a lot of you talked about democracy. Here's what I want to tell you. Democracy is not clean. Democracy is messy. And if democracy is going to work for us, we must invite the messiness of democracy. Clean democracy is driven from authoritarianism. We must demand the messiness of democracy 
I'll take democracy as messy as it is. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Tefir. We go uh, further on to uh, our sisters in India, Seva, Manili Shal. Give her a big applause on the way up here. Um, namaste, sisters and brothers. Um, currently, economic power are shifting globally. The multinationals have spread their web operations globally. Along with it, economic power is also shifting, and the poor workers, especially workers in the informal economy, are caught up in this uh, web operations. The multinationals, big companies, outsource the work. As a result, in my country, earlier 10% of the work was given through contracts. And now it is 90% of work is given through uh, contracts. We are organizing, for example, we are organizing waste recyclers. And now in India, the waste collection is done through multinationals. And these traditional waste recyclers are not getting waste. They are out of the solid waste management chain. And millions of poor, millions of poor waste, re waste recyclers are becoming more poor because of these multinationals. Also, the outsource work has reached the homes of uh, the workers. Thus, home-based workers have increased across the uh, globe. Unfortunately, this outsourcing has created a long supply chain with loss of contractors in between. The workers, especially women, are at the bottom of the pyramid of the supply chain. At all levels, Commission gets deducted and the workers get low wages. Not a single dollar per day. On the other hand, the skills and technology does not get tickled down and there is no improvement in the skills of the workers. They get more and more vulnerable. Secondly, due to economic conditions, inflation, is on ever high. The wages of workers have not increased to match the inflation. Hence, the workers have to get engaged in two, three trades of the informal sector to, learn, uh, to earn the living. More the work in informal economy is not sustainable. It has resulted into long hours of work no income security, no social security, and occupational hazards. Thirdly, economic uh, reforms have led to shrinking of formal sector economy, thus increasing informal economy. The current legislation's policies are not covering informal economy. In my country, in India, Labor reforms are going on, and unfortunately, these informal workers are not covered. covered. One of the ways to stop shifting of economic power is, very first is ratification of ILO Convention 177 on homework, and C-189 on domestic workers. I urge ITUC and all affiliate to, to support, support this uh, campaign. Secondly, the ITUC should run the trial by trial campaign for the home base workers. And other thing is that ITUC ought to bring out a global labor report on home base workers. And the lastly, 
Social dialogue should be promoted by ITUC at regional levels to promote ILO recommendation 204. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we go on to a representative from ITF, uh, Paddy Kramlin. See, I'm getting a start on me four minutes. The watchers in the Southern Hemisphere work the same as the watchers in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't know, we haven't had too many from the Southern Hemisphere up here. So I'll do my best with my four minutes. Now, we got here this morning with We Shall Overcome. I thought this is going to be a day, not like a day like yesterday. Well, I didn't really come to hear the candidate's statement. I came, I thought, when my mate from Belgium got up here and said, well, let's talk about activity. And then he ran a candidate's statement for four minutes. Well, that's indulgent and that's gratuitous. I, I'm here representing 20 million ITF transport workers in the supply chain. I came here not to talk, not for the rhetoric, not to have some debate, a rhetorical debate about democracy, but to go and deal with the class struggle that's going on out there, go and deal with a labour movement that hasn't got trade union density in Europe, in Africa. Africa's not even in the world economy. In South America, with the shift to the right, in North America, in Canada, throughout Asia Pacific, to come here and talk about what we're doing, not what we're going to do. Not to talk about a conversation four years ago, for Christ's sakes, or for Allah's sakes, four years ago, to come here and gossip as a premise, to spend us to have a debate backwards and forwards and not get on with the action and not get on with what working men and women want us to do here this week. So I appeal to you, the Global Union Federation is as much a part of the working class as you. The debate has gone past an interpretation of neoliberalism. We are now uh, 30 years after the collapse of the world in a neoliberalist world where there hasn't been a new methodology, where equity and social justice doesn't exist where we don't have the delivery of peace and not war, where workers, working men and women are more under threat than ever before, where we are linking the mines with the manufacturing, through the supply chain, back into retail, across our global society and our global community, where our infrastructure is being sold being privatised, where we fight every day for the right to strike, every day. And the ITUC has been standing next to my union, the ITF, in all of its manifestations to get that right to strike. It doesn't get done by rhetoric. It gets done because you go and challenge your governments. It gets done because you organise workers. It gets done because you give people working men and women the vision that they deserve. Now, for the next three or four days, let's talk about activity. Let's not talk about personalities. Let's go out there and work how we get the right to strike. My union's getting sued by $100 million, for $100 million by a multinationals because we know what the right to strike is. We work off the job and then we challenge the law afterwards. We do it through action. We do it through determination. We do it through courage. And we do it for unity. I appeal to the ITUC. There is no political force in this world today that exists for equity, social justice, for the future, for clean energy, for a transitional economy, except you. Assume your responsibilities. Work with the guffs. Let's go and change the world and stop apportioning blame on each other. Now, we have a saying in my ITF. I say union, you say power. All of us. I suppose it's a bit like the Filipino slamming on the thing. I say union, you say power. So come on, everybody. I say union, you say power. Union. Power. Union. You can do better than that. Lift your hands from South America, from Central America, from North America, from Africa, from Europe. Lift your hands, lift your feet. I say union, you say power. Union. Power. Union. Power. Now let's get on with the bloody job. Okay. Thank you. 
Now we move on to uh, FP. We move on to FPU Ukraine. Grigory Osovye. Господин председатель, прежде всего обращаюсь к вам, потому что я был в списке на выступление вчера, и поэтому позвольте некоторый микс к моему выступлению в контексте сегодняшней темы. Прежде всего, наша оценка от украинской делегации, что доклад Шарон Бароу проекта документов и горячая дискуссия в этом зале говорит о том, что у нас есть огромный нераскрытый потенциал для действий как Международной конфедерации труда и вопрос только состоит в том, как его нам успешно реализовать. И вопрос не только в словах и в призывах, а в том, что каждая организация Международная, организация, международная конфедерация труда должна действовать в соответствии с тем, что мы примем сегодня, завтра и послезавтра на этом съезде. Мы члены единой профсоюзной семьи, но тем не менее есть в каждой стране своя специфика деятельности. Каждая страна проходит свой политический, экономический и социальный путь развития и отсюда особенности тактики действий профсоюзов. Моя страна, Украина, стала сравнительно недавно независимым государством, избравшим этот путь развития демократии и европейской интеграции. Это был осознанный выбор всего гражданского общества, однако реформы в экономике и социальной сфере идут крайне болезненно и нередко граничат с нарушением прав трудящихся, социальный диалог время от времени подвергается наступлению. В докладе генерального секретаря Украины упоминается в числе стран, в которых не обеспечивается право профсоюзов на ассоциацию и на забастовку, и это соответствует действительности. Мы постоянно сталкиваемся с фактами и попытками законодательно ограничить нашу автономию и наши действия. В ряде регионов профсоюзы выдворяются из собственных зданий и принудительно отчуждаются учебные центры, это уже рецидив, который несовместим с правами профсоюзов, тем самым нарушаются основоположные права, которые нам гарантируют пакты экономические, социальные и политические ООН. Кстати говоря, в эти дни он отмечает свое 70-летие. И, конечно, на это мы реагируем соответствующим образом и, образом, и протестами, и обращением в судебный орган, и, конечно же, обращаемся за солидарной поддержкой в международной структуре. Хочу поблагодарить Международную конференцию труда за солидарную поддержку наших действий и недавно принятое решение о направлении специальной миссии в феврале того года МКПВРС в Украину. В то же время не могу не привлечь внимание делегатов в ситуации, которая крайне обострилась в моей стране после аннексии России и Крыма, поддержки военного конфликта восточных регионов, который уже длится 4 года, и недавним вопиющим захватом военными украинских судов и ранением моряков. В ответ на это власти Украины применили э, военное положение в 10 областях. Мир вновь оказался под угрозой, что требует соответствующей реакции не только со стороны политиков, но и гражданского общества и, конечно же, профсоюзов. Коллеги, мы должны быть бдительными и неравнодушными. Давайте помнить истории, извлекать из нее уроки. Только один выстрел в Сараево в 1914 году, повлекшим гибель одного человека, сдетонировал Первую мировую войну, которая повлекла за собой миллионы жертв и социальные огромные последствия. Поэтому призываю вас быть неравнодушным в этой ситуации. И желаю всем странам и трудящим мира, только в условиях мира мы можем обеспечить надлежащие права профсоюзов. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much, uh, Gregory. We move further on to Turkey, IS Turkey, Ergin Atalay. Sayın Başkan, değerli katılımcılar, Türk İş Genel Başkanı olarak Uluslararası Sendikalı Hareket'in en önemli toplantısı olan 4. Dünya Kongresi'nde 
sizlerle birlikte olmaktan mutluluk duyduğumu ifade ediyorum. Kongre'ye sunulan bildirinin başında ifade edildiği gibi dünya emekçileri olarak gücümüzü inşa etmek, gidişatın ve şu anda oynanan oyunun kuralını değiştirmek zorundayız. Bu oyun adil bir oyun değildir. Terör ülkemde ve dünyanın diğer ülkelerinde kötü ve çirkin yüzünü göstermeye devam etmektedir. Bazı gelişmiş ülkeler terör örgütlerine silah veriyorlar, moral veriyorlar, para veriyorlar, akıl veriyorlar. Bu ülkeler sivil vatandaş ölmüş, güvenlik görevlisi ölmüş, çocuk ölmüş, kadın ölmüş umurunda değil. Bu film dünyanın bazı ülkelerinde devam etmekte. Suriye'de, Irak'ta, Filistin'de, Yemen'de ve Gaddal, Gaddarca öldürülen gazeteci Kaşıkçı cinayetini gözünüzün önüne lütfen getirin. Çıkar oruna dünyayı şiddete sürükleyen ülkeler unutmayalım. Ülkemin sınırlarında terör örgütlerine binlerce tır dolusu silah vermeye devam ediyorlar. Bazı gelişmiş ülkeler terör örgütlerine silah satışını bırakmalı. Tüm dünya yoksulluğun ve adadetsizliğin ortadan kaldırılması için verilen mücadeleye destek olmalı. Örneğin bugün Yemen'de 3 yılı aşkın süredir çatışmalar yaşanmakta. Ülkenin yüzde 85'i açlıktan ve hastalıktan dolayı yardıma muhtaç durumdadır. Her gün yüzlerce çocuk ölmekte bunlara göz yummak ve yardımcı olmamak insanlık suçudur. Birleşik Milletler ve Uluslararası Topluma çağrıda bulunuyoruz. Daha ne bekliyorsunuz? Kendi çocuklarınız ve kendi yakınlarınızın daha huzurlu uyumalarını sağlamak istiyorsanız bu vahşete dur deyin. Dünya yarım asırdır Filistin'de olanları seyretmekte. İnsan onuruna yakışır koşuyorlar çalışmak Filistin halkının en temel hakkıdır. Değerli meslektaşlarım, tüm vatandaşları sivil toplum örgütleri ve hükümetlerle birlikte ülkemde Danimarka nüfusu kadar mülteci ev sahipliği yapmaktayız. Bunun 3,5 milyonu Suriyeli, geri kalanı dünyanın değişik ülkelerinden gelen mülteciler. Tüm zorluklara rağmen savaştan kaçan ve çocuklarına güvenle nefes alacakları yer arayan mültecilere karşı Türkiye insani vazifesini yerine getirmektedir. Uluslararası sendikal hareket olarak mültecilere dünyanın her yerine hoş geldiniz pankartı asıyoruz. Ne yazık ki bu demokrasinin beşiği olan Avrupa ülkeleri hala bunu kabul ettirmiş değiliz. Özellikle Amerika'nın tetiklediği ekonomik siyasi gerilim nedeniyle dünya belirsiz bir geleceğe sürüklenmekte, aşırı milliyetçilik, yabancı düşmanlığı, açgözlük hızla yükselmekte. Avrupa bu ortamdan etkilenmekte maalesef sosyal modeli korumakta zorlanmaktadır. Değerli meslektaşlarım, satın alma gücü gerileyen çalışanlar ve emekçiler dar ve sabit gerililer yaşanan ekonomik dalgalardan, dalgalanmalardan olumsuz bir şekilde etkilenmekte. İşçi ücretleri tüm dünyada gerilemekte. Ülkemde hala hazırda 3 milyon işsiz bulunmakta. Biz yeni ve kaliteli iş imkanları oluşmasını talep ederken bazı şirketler konkarto ilan ederek işleri işten çıkarmakta. Bu kabul edilir bir durum değildir. Küresel düzeyde ticaret savaşları adı altında oynanan oyunları biliyoruz. Türk işi olarak her zaman olduğu gibi ekonomik bağımsızlıktan yana oluyoruz. Ülkemizin birlik beraberliği için milletin yanında yer almaya devam edeceğiz. Değerli katılımcılar, sendikalar ve sivil toplum örgütleri özgürlüklerden ve demokrasiden yana olmak zorundadırlar. Dünyanın her neresinde olursa olsun darbelere karşı durmak, terör örgütlerine karşı durmak biz sivil toplum örgütlerinin ası görev olmalıdır. Biz bir ülkede terör varsa, şiddet varsa o ülkede sendikal haktan bahsedemezsiniz. Benim ülkemde de sıkıntılarım var. Taşeronların bir bölümü kadro ve geçe geçmeyen kitler var. Geçişlerin problemleri var. İş kazalarından cinayetler devam ediyor. Emekliye yaşa takılanlarla ilgili problemlerimiz devam ediyor. Değerli katılımcılar, özellikle G20'de katkılarından dolayı, çalışma hayatında katkılarından dolayı Şarım Barova teşekkür ediyorum. 10 ayda ülkeme 41 milyon misafir geldi, turist Thank geldi. You. Ülkemle ilgili kötü propaganda yapma, bazı ülkeler ve televizyonlar yapma devam ediyor. Paris ne kadar güvenliyse Türkiye o kadar güvenli. Saygılar sunuyorum. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now it's a mistake on the list. Uh, Frances O'Grady, she took the floor in a question earlier this morning. So now we go to Sattar from uh, Ahik, Azerbaijan. So Sattar, uh, and uh, as he was not prepared, I just uh, give a little hint to all the speakers. There is a clock on the on the on the podium. 
and uh, that clock is ticking down. So when it's 30 seconds left, then you can start to continue to end your report, and then we can hold the time of four minutes. I will uh, continue to end the time of the four minutes. So welcome. Uh, Председател, уважаеми участни съезда, сестри и братя, от имени Профсоюза Азербайджана сърдечно приветствую участников четвертого съезда и желаю всем нам успешной работы. Четвертый съезд Международной конфедерации профсоюзов проходит в значимое для Международного профсоюзного движения время. Мы находимся в преддверии 150-летия Первого профсоюзного союза и 70-летия принятия общей декларации прав человека. В этой связи на нас возглавляются большие задачи по защите социально-экономических прав трудящихся, систематическое углубление и активизации этой работы. Уважаемые коллеги, в феврале текущего года состоялся 4 съезд Конфедерации профсоюза Азербайджана. И мы отметили 25 годовщину создания нашей Конфедерации. С огромной благодарностью мы Отмечаем личное участие президента Международной конфедерации профсоюзов Жао Фелисио в этих мероприятиях и оцениваем это как внимание к деятельности профсоюзов Азербайджана. Сегодня основная тема четвертой съезда – формирование потенциала работников, изменение правил. Она актуальна и для нашего региона, и для нашей республики. Повышение социального благосостояния трудящихся в Азербайджане, шаги предпринятия – в стране, но социальной защиты населения говорят об успехах, достигнутых на этом пути. Уважаемые участники съезда, успехи, достигнутые нашей республикой, в последние годы радуют нас. По итогам прошлого года доходы населения Азербайджана увеличились на 8,3%. Среднемесячная зарплата выросла на 5,7%. За последние 15 лет в стране создано 1 900 тысяч новых рабочих мест. Почти не все из них постоянные. Уровень бедности составляет 5,4%. Безработицы 5%. Достигнуты в республике успехи были достойно отмечены в международных структурами. Так довольно экономический форум отмечает Азербайджан как страны с повышенной экономической конкурентоспособностью вывел нас на 35 место. Дорогие друзья, известно, что основным стимулом Уступление работников в ряде профсоюзов, их законные права на защиту, их трудовых прав и интересов. В то же время, качественные результаты проводимой мотивационной работы зависят от уровня компетентности, осуществляемой профсоюзами правозащитной деятельности. Хотелось бы напомнить, одно из положений, высказанных генеральным секретарем НКБ Шарон Баров на третьем связи Конфедерации, в том, что... Конфедерация ставит свои цели прийти в четвертой съезде с 20 миллионов целенской базой. Выполняя эту рекомендацию съезда МКП, в отчетный период Конфедерации профсоюза Азербайджана увеличили свои ряды на 56 570 новых целенов профсоюзов. Мы при принятии в республике страновой программы по достойному труду на 2016-2020 годы было принято продолжение профсоюзов страны по развитию гендерной и молодежной политики, по борьбе с неформальной экономикой, углублению трехсторонного диалога, развитию молодежной занятости. Конфедерация профсоюза Азербайджана с целью осуществления поставленных в сторону программы задач приняла на заседание исполкома концепцию деятельности профсоюзов, в которой конкретизировал пути инклюзивного развития занятости населения, активизация экономики, устранение формальной занятости. Уважаемые коллеги, сегодня профсоюз Азербайджан настойчиво стремится к осуществлению задач, поставленных в программу ООН с целью устойчивого развития. На повестке дня стоит еще один актуальный вопрос. В будущей сфере труда сегодня мы должны дать оценку будущим ситуациям, считая, что ожидаемый процесс вызовы необходимости вновь пересмотрят форму и характер Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we go further on to SEC, ACV Belgium, Mark Lehmanns. Brothers and sisters, dear colleagues, 
the darkest periods of the former century start to revive. 100 years ago, after the ending of the First World War, the ILO was founded to avoid that social distress would lead to another world war. Today we are at the eve of ILO's centenary. In 2020, we will celebrate the 75th anniversary of ending the Second World War, which led us to the Philadelphia Declaration. I really hope we will not, not get into a new world conflict to afterwards improve social rights. Let us use the central place for global social progress. And that's not conflicts. That is the ILO, the parliament of the world of work. So brothers and sisters, no workers' power without power for the ILO. That's for sure. I'm sure nobody in this room questions that. But then we also have to accept the consequences. Firstly, we have to help the ILO through the reform of the United Nations, safeguarding his core role, his financial means and manpower, his autonomy, and his unique tripartite governance structure. Secondly, accepting that ILO, because of its unique tripartite structure, can only remain relevant by result-driven negotiations, which means by definition seeking agreements, agreements. And to put it the hard way, the ILO is threatened. Of course, more and more governments dislike global interference because social standards limit, in their opinion, their neoliberal policies. More and more governments dislike, therefore, ILO. And the employers within ILO, organized in IOE, take advantage of this situation. They questioned and they challenged in 2012 openly the right to strike, a crucial embedded right in Convention 87 on the freedom of association. Under the guidance of ITUC, and with all the workers' group in the Committee of Application of Standards and in ILO, we succeeded to counter the attacks. I underscore this because it is very important. It is easy, it is really easy to provoke a new destructive crisis in ILO by launching a new debate on the right to strike. The employers, they would simply love it. For them, it's a new alibi to question the role of the ILO itself. I'm not sure how the ILO will survive this again. With the joint agreement, joint employers workers, we preserved that each year, 24 bad countries for workers' rights are prosecuted including many where the right to strike is severely under attack. And the right to strike remains strong and remains solid. Are we really convinced that reopening the debate will lead to a better outcome with all those bad governments around us? The right to strike is still there as part of the freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, unquestionably. And the independent experts of ILO are in this on our side. They join our positions. What lays behind us is no defeat, it's a success. What lays ahead of us, it's a huge challenge. What we now need is the right to collective bargain, to organize wherever we can, in every business model, and for every kind of relationship, employment relationship, with a strong ITUC, we can and we will. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, We've moved forward on to uh, KSBCI Indonesia, Eduardo Paslin Marbung. Thank you, Chair. Uh, today, it is uh, the risk of the workers to fight their uh, right, to fight their uh, dignity. And in the democracy, we are already on the democracy era. After uh, last time we have in the 
military regime. But the, our challenge is not uh, very easy. In the real life, our, work, our members in, in all regions already since 2014, 28 people uh, have been arrested by the governments due to their fighting strike demands in the real day life. I myself also, one year in jail, it, it is binding, still binding. It is funny, uh, it is funny words, you know, uh, government also still funny. They decide our union cannot use our own rules, but we are still fighting. Without power, we are not represented in the national, local, 325 people represent in the three-party level. They cannot uh, cancel this, our, our, our stand up. And then thank you for uh, ITC, stand on this. And our sister Saran Bawo fighting together in the street during May Day with us, with the risk from military and the police. And as he saw, she saw the, the, the strength building workers' power in the real life of workers. And thank you also for our colleagues member of ITUC who support, even we are fighting, but social dialogue is, is important. We building our social dialogue with the employer. We have uh, agreement with employer to building social dialogue in all regions and make MOU. And then also we uh, organize Samsung supply in Batam together with ITUC on the global uh, organizing and also support our unions, ITC support to help migrant workers uh, to, to fight their rights, uh, form the uh, legal forms to, to, to, to, to for their uh, dignity and also wage campaigns. We have four years increasing more than 45 percent wages in Indonesia, even we are difficult on negotiation. For these four years, we have increased 45% uh, of wages. Uh, it is all. Thank you. Building Oscar's power. Thank you very much. Um, we move forward on to Ellen Norway, Trinelise Sundnes. Floor is yours. Thank you, Kole. Dear friends, Sunday, the Director General of the ILO, uh, Guy Ryder, underlined the importance of the work at the ILO, decent work for all, for all and justice. And yesterday, our leader, Sharon Barrow, followed up by stating that we must fight to protect the right to organize and to bargain collectively every day. We put your trust in you, Sharon. I would like to pay tribute to the workers' group at the ILO for their work. They are committed, they work hard to safeguard the standards, to develop sound policies, and to safeguard the supervisory system at the ILO. They play a key role in this. And I say this because I know as a former governing body member, the huge workload, the difficulties they meet, the challenges, the complexity of the decisions that they have to make, but we put their trust in them. That is also why our delegation would like to strengthen the wording in the chapter about fundamental standards and the right to strike by adding a sentence in para 68, stating the key role that they play on our behalf. I trust that the Congress agrees. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, now we give the floor to a very important uh, person. Uh, it's from the independent uh, 
Kazakhstan trade union Situk that has actually come here with a big pressure on his uh, shoulders. So uh, please give a big applaud to, uh, to um, the speaker from Kazakhstan, Kuspan Kazurolov. Уважаемые братья и сестры, от имени Конфедерации независимых профсоюзов Республики Казахстан приветствую участников Конгресса Международной Конфедерации профсоюзов. Мы ценим поддержку, которую получает наш профсоюзов от МКП. Хочу выразить искреннюю благодарность всем вам за солидарность, которую проявляете в наших профсоюзах и лидерами, которые независимых профсоюзов нашей страны. Хочу поблагодарить Шарен Бару и всех нас, всех вас нас поддерживал и поддерживает эти тяжелые нас годы. За последние несколько лет Конфедерация независимых профсоюз Республики Казахстан и несколько ее членов организаций были принудительно ликвидированы. С уголовным преследованием столкнулись лидеры Конфедерации Лариса Харкова, Нурбек Кушакпай и Амин Илюсинов. Нурбек Кушакпаев и Амин Илюсин получили реальные тюремные сроки. На сегодняшний день Амин и Нурбек вышли на свободу и вернулись домой к своим семьям. Это хоть маленькая, но наша общая победа. Я хочу выразить всем вам слова благодарности за это. Совсем недавно, в конце сентября, с преследованием столкнулся один из лидеров КНПРК Ерлан Балтовай. В начале ноября подвергся нападению и жестоку, жестокому избиению лидер КНПРК в одном из регионов Казахстана Дмитрий Синявский. Его здоровье постепенно восстанавливается, и мы надеемся на его скорейшее выздоровление. Независимые профсоюзы Казахстана на протяжении многих лет не могут пройти регистрацию в соответствии с новым законодательством, в том числе трижды отказывали в регистрации профсоюза, в котором я состою в Магистауском регионе. Мы будем добиваться признания нашей легального статуса снова и снова, пока не получим возможности для нормальной открытой деятельности наших организаций. Мы действуем в рамках закона и хотим иметь все права, гарантированные казахстанским законодательством и международными нормами. Мы считаем, что Международная организация труда должна рекомендовать правительству Казахстана выполнить взятые на себя обязательства по ратифицированным основополагающим конвенциям МОД 87 и 98, гарантирующим работникам свободу объединения в профсоюзе и свободу профсоюзной деятельности. Обращаясь к братьям и сестрам из Международной конфедерации профсоюз, продолжает международную кампанию в поддержку независимых профсоюз нашей страны. Мы в Казахстане чувствуем поддержку международного профсоюзного движения. И в этой солидарности находим силы и деятельности в дальнейшей борьбе за социальные и трудовые права казахстанских работников. Только нашими общими усилиями, усилиями всего международного рабочего движения мы можем положить конец давлению на независимые профсоюзы в Казахстане, обеспечить свободу, безопасность и профсоюзной деятельность в нашей стране. Спасибо вам за поддержку. Thank you very much, Kuspan. Um, very important that we still continue to, to assist uh, Kazakhstan to have an independent trade union movement. Thank you very much, Kuspan. We move forward on, for, uh, uh, further on to uh, I took India, the Singh Ashok Kumar. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Sisters and brothers, it's going, okay. Sisters and brothers of the World Congress sitting here, I want to give in advance very happy Christmas and very happy New Year from the INTUC. I want to draw your kind attention of the ITUC. Madam, India is one of the biggest country of the world, biggest population in the world, and biggest population of the working class in the world. 
in about 470 million. But unfortunately, it's the first time in the history of the country, the government, the present government, led by Mr. Modi, who want to finish the trade union and the workers in the country, they are making the policy in the support of the capital and against the working class. They want to finish the trade union. Such a amended rules for the trade union act, nobody can form the union even. Sir, madam, and brothers and sisters who are sitting here, I want to pay my respect, regard, and want to touch the feet from here, who is my philosopher, guide, and my teacher, Mr. G. Sanjay Reddy, who is the senior leader, trade union leader of the country, not only country of the world, who has devoted his life to the working class, to the cause of working class. Madam, your, your ambition to build IITUC 250 million. Today is the membership is 200, 207. And we have the working class in our country, 470 million, which Mr. Reddy wants to, and all these, sir, all the trade union centers together in the history of our country, first time united together against to fight the government, to fight with Modi, to finish them. And I want to assure you that with this juncture, with this ideology, with this unity of the trade union, in the coming forthcoming election of the parliament, the present government will be nowhere in the country. He want to finish the working class, and the working class will finish them forever so that nobody can touch, nobody can imagine, nobody can see to finish, nobody can have planned to finish the working class of the country. Who, who, who you want to finish whom? Who build the nation? Who build everything? You want to finish them? It means you want to finish yourself. Madam, and the brothers and sisters here, certainly it's a very bad time we are facing. The working class of the country, our country, India, is facing a very bad time, but we are not afraid. We don't have tension because our Mr. Reddy, our leader, is playing with the problem all the time. That's why problem is away from them. Problem is away from the working class. Yes, we have been there, Mr. Sidhu told, when you went there for a press conference, after that press conference, our government have a ban on Orisha, to ban the entry of Orisha. Then my president, Mr. Reddy, told the government, don't do that, otherwise sit here. Then they oblige and clear Orisha. Yes, I want only one request to Madam, Please concentrate on India. Please give a thought on India and have a plan and an agenda to India so that India will certainly emerge. And when India will emerge, IT will emerge. Thank you. And building a power, worker powers in the world. Yeah. The world can see what is the power of the workers. This is my submission. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Thank you very much. Uh, we move forward on to. Uh, Zambia, Kusmas Makuka. Dear delegates, I stand here to represent uh, my Secretary General Kosmas Mukoka, just in case you are wondering if I'm Kosmas. My name is Annette. Let me start by thanking Sister Sharon Barrow and the entire ITUC Secretariat for the wonderful report we received yesterday. That activity report gave us a clear area of view of activities taking place in the world of work today. To say the least, much of it was quite provoking. Colleagues, 
we need a different economic governance. The current rules, notably the Stability Growth Pact, are killing our economic growth. So rules must change. Yes, we need to think about how we can make our society more democratic. There is a general feeling that the African countries are sufficiently democratic. Are they? I would say they are not sufficiently democratic. Together, we are strong. Together, we should continue to fight for the next 100 years to make Africa a better place to live in and an African continent that should stand for our values as workers. I want to remind you, dear colleagues, that our constituency that we represent is being further pushed into poverty. Recent trends show that democracy has unfortunately favored capital more than the workers and the poor. Our campaign to end corporate greed under the leadership of Sharon Barrow has made us as trade unions stand with the most exploited vulnerable. And this should be our resolve in this Congress to remain determined to build a better world for workers, which at the moment represents deeply entrenched injustices of global economic systems alongside shrinking democratic space and deteriorating labor rights. I am convinced together we can do it we have a proud history to look back to. And now, from this Congress, we must make a proud future to look forward to. Viva Congress! Thank you. We move forward on to Belarus. Uh, Alexandre Yarashuk is coming here, running. Уважаемые коллеги, братья и сестры, глобализация и экономические кризисы серьезно повлияли на положение работников и профсоюзов. МКП необходимо найти ответы на вызовы времени, иначе влияние профсоюза будет и дальше сворачиваться. Настало время принципиально изменить нашу стратегию из оборонительной, она должна превратиться в наступательную. И сделать это поможет возврат к осмыслению исторической миссии профсоюзов. Самое время вспомнить о временах, когда профсоюзы позиционировали себя в качестве общественно-политической силы, влияние которой не ограничилось борьбой за права и интересы трудящихся. Профсоюзы должны стать одной из главных сил, претендующих на изменение мирового порядка в интересах всей мировой цивилизации. Необходимо существенно расширить пространство своих приоритетов, выйти за пределы социального партнерства. Только стратегический возврат к целям глобального влияния на судьбы человечества способен изменить к нам отношения, укрепит наши позиции во всех сферах жизни, в том числе и в сфере самого социального партнерства. Мы должны принять вызов времени и заявить, что нас еще рано хоронить, Пока существует наемный труд, существует несправедливость, будет сохраняться запрос на организации рабочих. Мы единственные в мире производители уникального продукта под названием «Справедливость». Именно это обеспечивает запрос на наше существование на все времена. Спрос на профсоюзы будет существовать так же, пока в мире существуют авторитарные, авторитарные режимы, такие как в моей стране, в Беларуси или в том же Казахстане. Они беспощадно эксплуатируют рабочих, лишают их всех прав, превращают в рабов, уничтожают независимые профсоюзы. Спрос на нас будет сохраняться, пока существует, как сегодня, правая угроза. Для нее интересы и права простого человека отнюдь не являются приоритетом. Поэтому ни завтра, ни послезавтра, дорогие друзья, Мир не станет совершенным, не исчезнут 
кризисы и конфликты, неся неисчислимые страдания людям, работникам. Повестка наших дел сверстана. Мы знаем, чем заниматься. У нас есть на кого опереться, кого пригласить союзники. Это весь спектр прогрессивных политических сил, огромный пласт самых разнообразных общественных и правозащитных организаций. На нашем форуме мы должны во весь голос заявить, мы не только приняли вызовы времени, но и готовы к борьбе. Борьбе за лучший мир, за мир без насилия и крови, за ликвидацию несправедливости, за мир, в котором человеку живется уютно и комфортно, за мир, где человек имеет достойный труд и достойное за него вознаграждение. Объединимся же во имя этой благородной цели. Сделаем мир лучше. Вместе мы победим! Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. We go forward on to FTF Denmark. Bente Sorgenfrey. I will speak in uh, Danish. Kære venner, kære kollegaer, jeg er så glad for at se her, jer her i dag. Ikke kun fordi vi er i København, men fordi det er et vigtigt signal, at vi er sammen her om afgørende dagsordner for verdens arbejder og vores fælles bevægelse. I en tid med dalende respekt for internationale institutioner og normer, i en tid med voksende populisme, racisme og alle former for ekstremisme, er sammenhold og fællesskab en forudsætning. For os i den danske fagbevægelse går kampen mod social dumping hånd i hånd med kampen for lige behandling og bedre arbejdsvilkår for arbejdere i hele verden. At vi er her i dag viser, at der er så meget, der forener os, så meget, der kan overvinde det, som formiddagens diskussioner viste kunne skille os. Så lad os bruge denne kongres til at slå fast, at vi har fælles interesser, og vi arbejder på meget fokuserede mål. Vi er et stærkt fællesskab. Vi er verdens største fagbevægelse, som de sætte Rigsgaard fra LO Danmark sagde i sin velkomsttale her til kongressen. En arbejder fra en anden del af verden er en kollega og ikke en fjende. Løsninger på krig, på arbejdsløshed og på elendighed er ikke at lukke øjnene, for vores grænser. Lukke øjnene også for vores grænser. Vi må insistere på, at løsninger på migrantstrømme er, at folk sikres anstændige leve- og arbejdsvilkår, hvor end i verden de bor. Det er derfor ikke tiden til at skære i udviklingsbistanden. Det er tværtimod tiden til at insistere på, at vores regeringer og internationale organisationer øger og målretter deres hjælp, så bistand bidrager til at skabe anstændige job, så folk har mulighed for at forsørge sig selv og deres familier. Det er en forudsætning for at kunne løse en del af problemet, som verden har så rigeligt af. FN og ikke mindst ILO, som til næste år bliver 100 år, og tak til Guy Ryder for en fantastisk stærk tale i søndags, svækkes af populisme, angreb fra arbejdsgiverne og manglende opbakning fra regeringerne. Vi skal som fagbevægelse bekæmpe disse angreb. Vi skal bakke op og styrke internationale institutioner. Den grådighed, der kommer til udtryk ved, at virksomheder eller enkeltpersoner ikke bidrager til fællesskabet gennem skattebetaling, skal bekæmpes. Fremmed had, racisme og ekstremisme skal bekæmpes med klar tale og konkret handling. Fagbevægelsen er en helt afgørende spiller på denne bane. Trepartsdialog, fokuseret handlet, handling og et rungende ja til solidaritet på tværs af grænser er vores afgørende værktøjer. Jeg giver min fulde opbakning til udtalelserne om fred, demokrati og rettigheder og vil gerne sige tak til Sharon og til resten af sekretariatet for de sidste fire års arbejde. Tak for ordet. Thank you very much, Bente. Um, 
We move forward to Thailand. Savit Kervar Kervin. Kervin. Savit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We all, who are in this room, from the beginning of this to the present, we have to meet the challenges of the government of the government. การเติบโตของทุนเสรีนิยมรัฐบาลอนุรักษ์นิยมปเด็จการรวมทั้งกฎเกณฑ์กติกาและกฎหมายที่ไม่เป็นธรรม Okay, so we interpret and okay. So we have so much request of the powers. We have because uh, labor movement is attack, and we have growing power of neoliberal capitalism and rising dictatorship in Thailand. We have unjust and unfair of the so-called justice or the legal system. We want to build power, unity from all over the world to fight with the unfairness of the corporation and the power that be. And Thailand's situation is getting worse in terms of political, economic, and social inequality and workers' rights attack. We have long road to victory, but we want to stop fighting. We are calling for the power of the people to be able to fight for the world to be able to fight. จากฝ่ายทุนที่บีบบังคับเราสาการในประเทศไทยเราต้องต่อสู้ทางการเมืองเศรษฐกิจความเหลื่อมล้ำทางสังคมและสิทธิทางด้านแรงงานแต่เราไม่ประสบความสำเร็จประเด็นเรื่องรถไฟเราต่อสู้เพื่อความปลอดภัยแต่เราต้องถูกไล่ออกจากงานพร้อมชดใช้ค่าเสียหายจำนวนเงินที่มหาศาลด้วยการปฏิเสธงานที่ไม่ปลอดภัย so, so my union state railway union of Thailand we fought for safety of the train, but we were dismissed and we were ordered to pay fine for over 700 US dollars for seven of us because the government accused us of staging illegal strike. Why, what we do, we campaign for workplace safety to save lives of, of the workers and civilians. Rwam Tangkan Lama Siti Kong Sa Pha Pra Ngan Mitsubishi Electric and Kwa Thet Thai Sing Thua Pin Rueng Leo Rai Thi Mai Sa Ma Thi Cha Yom Rap Dai and the situation with Mitsubishi Electric in Thailand that, that is really bad and that's really worse, unacceptable. การเปลี่ยนแปลงกฎหมายกฎเกณฑ์ของฝ่ายทุนรัฐบาลอนุรักษ์นิยมอำนาจประเด็จการเพื่อสิทธิของคนงานเป็นเรื่องที่สำคั
تفشي مظاهر العنصرية العرقية والجنسية والثقافية واستهداف حق الأقليات والمعارضة وتنامي النزعة إلى الهيمنة واستشراء النزاعات المسلحة والتطرف والتعصب العقائدي والتسلط المطلق للسياسات النيوليبرالية وظهور أشكال جديدة من الاستعمار الغير المباشر تقوده الشركات المتعددة الجنسيات التي تكرس أشكال التشغيل الهش إلى جانب ما يترتب عن وجودها من مخاطر التلوث البيئي واستنزاف الثروات البلداني في طريق النمو وخاصة في قاراتنا الإفريقية حيث ترتفع نسبة الانقطاع عن التمدرسي وارتفاع نسبة البطالة والفقر وتراجع القطاعات الخدماتية تواجه الحركة النقابية العمالية تحديات صعبة حيث يستهدف العمل النقابي بالتضييق على الحق النقابي ومحاصرة المنظمات النقابية المستقلة والمناضلة وترهيب النقابيين بالسجن والاغتيالات إخوتنا أصدقائنا ورفاقنا مطروح على اتحادنا للنقابات الدولية الدفع من أجل مزيد توحيد الحركة العمالية النقابية وتفعيل دوره ليكون شريكا اجتماعيا فاعلا مؤثرا وحاسما في صنع القرار الدولي والعمل على إرساء منوال تنموي مندمج عالمي يضمن الحقوق الاقتصادية والاجتماعية لكافة شعوب العالم وتعزيز قيم المساواة والعدالة الاجتماعية بوضع آليات ناجعة ومتابعتها للمناهضة كل أشكال العنف ومظاهر التمييز بما يضمن التعايش السلمي والحوار بين الحضارات وأقرار المساواة الفعلية والتامة بين المرأة والرجل والعدالة بين المجتمع الدولي نعم للتضامن بين المنظمات النقابية المنتسبة للاتحاد الدولي للنقابات للتصدي لكل أشكال الهيمنة السياسية والاستغلال الاقتصادي والاستعباد الاجتماعي والتعصب والتطرف العقائدي نعم من أجل تغيير قواعد النسق شانجي Les règles, c'est changer le système. Vive CSI. Thank you very much. And I must say, in the way down, uh, Saim, uh, if anybody don't know it in the in here, uh, UGTT was rewarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, a couple of years ago, of course, uh, of their involvement in in the peace process in Tunisia. So I think they will give them a big hand for the Nobel Peace Prize to Tunisia. So we, I think we will. Uh, we have two more speakers before lunch. It's Roberto Raúl Barrel and then Unai Sordo from the CCO Spain. So first uh, Roberto and then uh, Unai before lunch. Buenos días a todas las compañeras, compañeros, trabajadores y trabajadoras del mundo. Soy Roberto Baradel, Secretario de Relaciones Internacionales de la Central de los Trabajadores Argentinos. En nuestro continente están pasando, como en varios continentes, una avanzada de lo que es la derecha, de lo que es el neoliberalismo, de lo que son las políticas de ataque a los trabajadores fundamentalmente y de saqueo de los recursos naturales, favoreciendo la especulación financiera, favoreciendo a, los, a las corporaciones fundamentalmente. Nuestro país, lamentablemente, en tres años se ha endeudado más que en toda su historia y el gobierno está llevando adelante una política de ataque a las organizaciones sindicales, de ataque a los dirigentes sindicales, de ataque a los jueces laboralistas, de ataque a los organismos de derechos humanos. Sin ir más lejos, hoy se publicó en la Argentina en el boletín oficial una autorización para que las fuerzas de seguridad disparen, las fuerzas de seguridad federales disparen inclusive por la espalda, sin dar la voz de alto. Están institucionalizando la pena de muerte en la Argentina. Y hay persecuciones y ataques permanentes, eh, restricciones al derecho de huelga y querer cobrar multas millonarias a los sindicatos. Por eso creo que es fundamental las resoluciones de este Congreso. 
lo que planteaba la compañera de Dinamarca con respecto al tema de la declaración, con respecto a la ilusión fiscal. El saqueo y el endeudamiento en nuestros países creo que tiene que ser una posición muy clara de los trabajadores rechazando este tipo de prácticas y, por supuesto, reclamando la mejora de la calidad de vida de los trabajadores y de nuestros pueblos. Por supuesto que hay países como Colombia donde a los dirigentes sindicales se los asesina y nosotros en esto tenemos que ser muy claros y creo que las iniciativas que ha tomado la CCI y en este caso quiero agradecer en particular por los ataques que venimos recibiendo la postura de la Confederación Sindical Internacional como la postura de Sharon Barrow o de Luca Vicentini o de Susana Camuso de Europa sosteniendo, solidarizándose y sosteniendo el reclamo que nosotros llevamos adelante. Una cosa más, el futuro del trabajo el año que viene se va a discutir en AUIT. No puede haber futuro del trabajo sin discutir el futuro de los trabajadores. No dejemos que separen el trabajo de los trabajadores. Hay que tener en cuenta que el trabajo es parte de la dignidad humana y por eso tenemos que ser muy fuertes, muy concretos y llevar una iniciativa a la OIT y decir claramente que no puede haber futuro del trabajo sin futuro de los trabajadores. Fuerza compañeras y compañeros y este Congreso tiene que darnos la fuerza para dar la pelea en nuestros países y denunciar las injusticias. Gracias. Thank you very much. And then, uh, uh, finally, it's uh, Unai Sordo from CCO Spain. Buenas tardes ya, compañeras y compañeros. Lo primero, un saludo fraternal desde las Comisiones Obreras de España a todos los delegados y delegadas de este Congreso. Yo tengo que intervenir, y en cuatro minutos, porque es una de las intervenciones atrasadas de ayer, se supone que hacer una defensa de una enmienda que presentábamos 11 sindicatos, hacer algún tipo de valoración del informe de actividades y, evidentemente, hacer alguna referencia, puesto que no estamos en un club de debate solamente, sino que estamos en un congreso en el que vamos a elegir entre dos candidaturas a la próxima Secretaría General. Avisamos en el Consejo General del domingo que este sistema iba a mezclar los debates, se iba a ser poco operativo para poder afrontar los retos, las reflexiones sobre los retos que la CSI tiene en el próximo periodo. Nuestra enmienda, a la que apenas voy a dedicar 15 segundos, tenía que ver con mejorar la redacción en todo lo referido al trabajo informal. El trabajo informal, que tiene que ver con formas arcaicas de explotación, pero que tiene que ver también con nuevas formas de dirección de las empresas, deslaboralizando las relaciones laborales, creando situaciones de explotación novedosas a través de la utilización de figuras como los falsos autónomos y otras, a través de una desvertebración de la negociación colectiva y a través del poder enorme que están ejerciendo muchas multinacionales en las regulaciones, en las legislaciones laborales. Son muchos los retos por esos poderes de las multinacionales por la integración económica, por el proceso de globalización que hemos conocido en estos últimos años a los que se enfrentan los sindicatos en el mundo. Y, por tanto, las organizaciones sindicales, porque así nos lo demanda nuestra afiliación, tenemos que exigir que la Confederación Sindical Internacional catalice y vertebre estrategias sindicales de ámbito mundial. Que la Confederación Sindical Internacional, para ello, mejore las formas de coordinación entre las organizaciones territoriales, así como las relaciones con las federaciones globales. Requerimos de un Consejo General que sea órgano de decisión y que no sea solo un grupo al que se informa para que avale decisiones ya adelantadas. 
Parece necesario, digo, reforzar el papel de las organizaciones territoriales que deben canalizar la información, recabarla y canalizarla de las organizaciones también que, siendo afiliadas, no forman parte del Consejo General. Compañeras y compañeros, consideramos que en este contexto de economía global, de poderes globales que están atenazando a las legislaciones laborales de nuestros países, la Confederación Sindical Internacional tiene que constituirse como un, un auténtico contrapoder a nivel mundial, un interlocutor necesario a instancias mundiales como el G20, como el Fondo Monetario Internacional, la OCDE, el Banco Mundial o el Foro de Davos. Y pensamos que el objetivo último de esta forma en la, de la mejora en la coordinación y en la participación de las organizaciones sindicales y territoriales, el objetivo último también de constituirnos como un contrapoder, tiene que ser una profunda sindicalización de la propia Confederación Sindical Internacional. Un mensaje claro y una apuesta clara por la defensa de los derechos y libertades civiles, empezando por el derecho de huelga ante la ofensiva patronal. Posiciones que refuercen la negociación colectiva y el diálogo social. Está bien construir campañas de sensibilización y de imagen en un tiempo en el que esto es muy importante, pero necesitamos vertebrar auténticas estrategias sindicales y creemos que la el liderazgo que requiere esta organización, que en nuestra opinión representa mejor que nadie la compañera Susana Camuso, tiene en estos, años, en estos cuatro años que tenemos por delante que ejercer ese liderazgo, esa vertebración y ese impulso del sindicalismo a nivel mundial. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Unai. That was the final speaker for this morning. I will give the floor to Sharon to react on things that have been said in the debate. Sharon. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I am simply going to uh, provide right reply on the amendments for today. And I can tell you they're all uh, represent, recommended to the Standing Orders Committee. The first one is indeed by CTA Autonoma, and it strengthens the uh, nature of public investment and ownership. The second one from uh, indeed uh, Norway, Trina Lisa, uh, ask that we recognise the role of the workers group and strengthens the demand to protect and develop ILO standards. That's uh, absolutely in line with the statement and our policy. From JTUC Ringo, there's a slight change to the statement on uh, pharmaceuticals, but I think it's in line with the, uh, the uh, intention of the statement that uh, indeed universal and affordable access to essential medicine sh that should be free for those unable to pay allows us to support it. In regard to uh, UGTS, then uh, the amendments in total are agreed. The first one, of course, around economic power on the IFIs and the demand for them to respect uh, uh, uh, right, labour rights and uh, freedoms the question of UN and other international agencies uh, strengthening uh, progressive taxation laws in, and, of course, uh, investing in public services. There's a question uh, that really is for tomorrow's model, but I think we can accept it today, around uh, a new model of trade. And, of course, it goes to the role of uh, trade rights and due diligence and, uh, and public services. All of the amendments, of course, are on the website and you can check them out there and I'll come back to that. In terms of the proposal of amendments by the UGT Tunisia, again, I would recommend to the Standing Orders Committee that uh, we accept these. It goes to the concerns they have about the trade agreements between developing and developed countries that uh, ignore economic and uh, social and environmental rights. It goes to the question of uh, the increased use of social networks through new technologies that, uh, by extremist groups, and it goes to the uh, question indeed of inequality stemming from a globalisation that's confi confined to commercial and financial questions, which aggravates discrimination of all kinds. In uh, the amendments by UNIO, um, are uh, uh, to uh, 
include universal in terms of quality public services. They, they go to the question of uh, investment in higher, higher quality in services and products through technology, the absence uh, indeed of social protection and how it uh, um, uh, affects women more predominantly, the question of quality education and research as an important tool for sustainable development, and it adds to indeed an FNV resolution already accepted that uh, um, goes again to quality curriculum and teaching and learning tools. And of course it picks up a further amendment in regard to intolerance and discrimination, racism and xenophobia at all levels. So I think absolutely uh, in line with the statement and our policies. And finally, again, the uh, FGTB, which is again in line with uh, the statement and policies, it strengthens actually the reference to both collective bargaining and social dialogue, making the critical point that indeed uh, social dialogue in itself is not enough and that you can't, uh, you can't simply deny collective bargaining. Again, it strengthens it at all levels, of course, putting the central and sectoral level at the top, but the fact that that democratic right extends to all levels to improve working conditions and wages. So with that, I would uh, thank you. There are, in fact, uh, the process, just to be clear, the amendments are on the website. This is a recommendation to the Standing Orders Committee, which of course will bring back the amended statement on Friday, where you have every opportunity to re-debate or re-amend or sub-amend the statement as is. So watch the website every day. The relevant amendments that have been put in will be put on, that, uh, on the website for you to consider. But uh, I uh, so move, Mr Chair. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, Joao, ask for the floor. Peter, há muitos oradores do plenário que me procuram afirmando que se inscreveram para a lista de oradores e não foram chamados. É, eu já solicitei à organização do Congresso que a lista seja total de oradores inscritos, seja publicado. Então, eu solicito novamente que publique a lista completa dos oradores inscritos para dar tranquilidade às pessoas que se inscreveram, que não sabem se fazem parte da lista ou não. Tá? Se não for publicada a lista no site ou alguma outra forma pública, essa lista de oradores, amanhã, na abertura dos trabalhos, eu vou ler a lista completa de todos os oradores que se inscreveram para ver se as pessoas estão sendo contempladas ou não. Eu acho que, em fazendo isso, daremos mais tranquilidade a todos os delegados presentes aqui no Congresso. Obrigado, Peter. Yes, um, thank you very much, Joao. Uh, we have uh, about 15 to 20 uh, speakers that have not uh, given... Okay, is that a question of order? Okay, welcome. Yeah, my name is Stefan Kürzel, I'm from the Deutschen Gewerkschaftsbund. Uh, ich möchte hier ganz kurz mal was sagen zu den Verfahrensregeln. Aber zuallererst möchte ich denen danken, die hier den meisten Überblick haben und für Ruhe und Gelassenheit sorgen. Das sind die Kolleginnen und Kollegen Dolmetscher. In diesem Chaos das zu schaffen, herzlichen Dank an die Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Aber wie hier umgegangen wird mit Rednerlisten, mit Meldungen, die vor zwei Tagen vorgenommen worden sind, und wie heute Leute eingebaut worden sind in der Reihenfolge der Rednerliste, die nicht dem entspricht, was wir gestern gesehen haben. Das geht so nicht, wenn man auch noch zu Sachen reden will, die gestern hier aufgerufen worden sind. Das ist ein Skandal. Und ich warte nicht dran und lasse mich nicht vertrösten vom Sitzungsleiter, der meinem Kollegen sagt, vielleicht komme ich am Freitag dran. Ich reise morgen ab. So geht das nicht. Das hat mit einem demokratischen Prozess und wie man sich nacheinander meldet, nichts zu tun. Ja, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, if we have more speakers than, than time, it will be a problem. And we, uh, now we had, uh, I think, nine names left on the speaking list for this morning. And of course, you know the debate we had uh, earlier on. I think it's, it will be uh, completely possible for everybody that uh, have uh, asked for the speech to make a speech for the Congress. 
And I will ask, indeed, for you, uh, I will ask the, the Standing Order Committee to, to, to watch into it so everybody is uh, fair played. Of course, we just give the word to everybody in the room that uh, wants to have it. No, not uh, 1,000 people can, can speak at the Congress, obviously, but uh, we, we will ask the Standing Order Committee to look in if we can uh, take down the time from four to three minutes or whatever they want to, to do so that everybody can speak at the Congress. Thank you very much, uh, and Joao, very good that you took it up. Um, uh, we have an announcement. You know that we, uh, at 1400 hours, will start the three parallel sub plenaries Future Work, Organizing and Wages and in Inequality. And at 4 o'clock, we have the deadline for submission of nominees for General Council from each region. So no later than 4 o'clock uh, today. And then tonight, at 7 o'clock, I'm proud, as the president of the Nordic Trade Union Movement, NFS, to invite you all to reception at the City Hall. Uh, we will uh, also that, uh, uh, see the, the glance of Copenhagen once more. But uh, you're all welcome at uh, 7 o'clock at the City Hall for uh, refreshment and some uh, dinner at the City Hall. So, uh, so we break for lunch and we be back uh, uh, to sub plenaries at 2 o'clock. Respected World Congress, trade union members, comrades, 